somehow I'm not seeing my screen anymore. Let's see. Here we go. We are seeing Twitter. you. Okay, I'm all up now on my screen. Um, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Today is July 10th, uh, 2024. I'm Andre Gadera and um, the uh, typically the co-host. So today I will be uh, chairing um, since Michelle uh, Labay is uh, out. Um, the and as far as the chair's report, um, that's all that I've got to uh, to report for you uh, today. Um, and uh, Mr. Zomek is uh, out as well today, so we won't have a, a director's report per se, but uh, um, we'll go ahead into some uh, land management updates and um, uh, see where we go. Um, Aaron? So um, we received quite a few um, conservation land use applications. And if it's OK, I'll just jump right into those. Um, Can I, uh, I'm sorry to, for the interruption. Uh, one thing that uh, we have been um, trying to get folks to uh, do a little bit differently uh, is to get um, uh, all applications and other materials in by the Wednesday before um, this uh, or Friday, right? Is it Wednesday or Friday? A Wednesday. By the Wednesday before our meetings, our regular meetings, we have been having a hard time having folks do that. Uh, please uh, make sure to do that in the future. Get them in by Wednesday because uh, we're we're probably not going to be considering things like that otherwise. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, the first um, for consideration is a, um, sorry, my computer's jumping around a little bit, is a um, elopement ceremony that's planned at Mount Pollux. Um, it is in your, the applications are all in your um, meeting packets, uh, but it's a, a very small um, event that is proposed on July 27th um, and not um, a lot of uh, infrastructure associated with this one. It's kind of a little bit more in line with what we um, typically see um, at Mount Pollux. I don't believe that they have any um, um, equipment or anything like that. Um, I believe it's just them and a justice of the peace. I'm just pulling up the application to confirm this. Three people. Um, three case. participants, yep, um, and just small ceremony. Mm. Well, uh, do we have uh, any comments from, uh, hello, Jason, uh, from uh -huh. commissioners, or is there any more, uh, Aaron, that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, I mean, uh, just the standard conditions that I would suggest are, you know, that first come, first serve, that people know that the property is open to everyone, and um, just include that in the um, information that's sent to them when they're granted their permit. Thank you. Um, well, as uh, as far as I can see, it's uh, re really straightforward. It's just three people there for a uh, um, what they're calling an elopement. Um, so, any comments from uh, the rest of the? Uh, if we'll then with that. Uh, do we need to? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, not necessarily pertaining to this, but as a result of our last discussion about something going on at Mount Pollux, just for the record, I visited Mount Pollux, and um, I don't think it's as sensitive a site as we might have thought. Uh, the town does a good job of mowing a, um, a way to the top of the hill. It's about 20 feet wide. There's no path, no evidence of a path anywhere in that mowed section. Um, so it, it appears that people, you know, space out when they go up there. I didn't mean space out like <laughs> they take distance. 
yeah. <laughs> um, and when I was there, there was a a birthday party going on, and they had uh, carried up chairs and um, a table and a trash bag, and where there was somebody else enjoying Mount Pollock. Didn't seem to interfere with the public. The parking lot was full. And um, uh, I think Mount Pollock is a fairly um, um, hard site. I don't think it's easily damaged. Uh, I, I just from my walkabout. And I will also say that I think the town might do some mowing around the uh, wooden <laughs> guardrail because it's hard to see. Mm -hmm. And it might think about maintaining the guardrail. It gives the appearance, uh, because it's fairly run down, that um, we're looking the other way, which is not the case. So I don't, uh, I, don't I can't say, uh, I couldn't say this offline because of the meeting rules. So I just take the time to say it now has nothing to do with what's in front of us. I'm all for it. Okay, Alex, thank you. Um, and yeah, I, I, I could see how it uh, a little extra maintenance might uh, go a long ways. Well, um, do we need a... Uh... Yeah, I will, I'll move to uh, approve the new land use application CLU 2410 at Mount Pollock's wedding elopement on 727-24. Okay. Oh, sorry, uh, Jason. With the uh, with the motion, I, I'm not sure who who did the second there. I think Alex was faster. No, Bruce was faster. Bruce. Sorry, Bruce. All right, thank you. I'll All give right. way to Bruce. Uh, with that, Bruce. Yes, I. Jason. I. Rachel. I. Alex. I. And I'm an I. Okay, great. So uh, now down to the next one, um, CLU 2411. Yeah, so I re uh, received an email from um, uh, the Common School, um, basically noting that they run summer camps and that they've been um, using the Larch Hill property for um, hikes during their um, summer camps at the Common School. And they basically were concerned about um, poison ivy on the trails and also asking if the town could mow a field that's between the common school and Larch Hill. And so um, I responded and said, oh, you know, you should submit a land use application because this is how we gauge sort of who's using the um, conservation areas and for what purposes. And, um, and I mentioned that I would speak to Dave about the maintenance requests that they provided. So um, this is basically just sort of formalizing the request to continue using the um, Larch Hill <clears throat> trail system for their um, camp hikes associated with common school camp. Okay. Any, um, any questions or uh, comments from, uh, from the other uh, commissioners? Okay, I uh, let's see, Rachel. How many campers is it? And is it daily? 20. 20? Oh, thanks. Bruce. Yeah, I, I would say that the um, that the term camper is a misnomer. I was a little concerned because uh, it looked like there were people who were going to be camping, just hiking through. And um, at first, but then I got a little more context. Bruce? Um, just wanted to double check whether any of the participants that are sitting in are for, here for these land use updates. If uh, if there's anybody here for the uh, land use updates, if you don't mind, please raising your hand. Um, I don't think any of the applicants are here tonight. All right. All right. Hang on a minute. Uh, 
Okay. Um, Alex? I'm not quite clear. I didn't hear you, Alex. We can't. I, I think you're on mute. No, it's something else. Now you're on mute, but all right. Now we could still, we can't hear you now. Would you like to, uh, would you mind trying to uh, join again? Sorry. Um, in the meantime, uh, I didn't see anybody from the public raise their hand. Um, well, in the absence of Alex's potential comment, I will I will make a motion to approve the land use application 2411 Larch Hill Summer Camp Heights Common School June 24 through August 2nd, 24. I second. All right. That's uh Jason with a with the motion, Rachel with a second. Um all right, uh, Rachel. Hi. Rose. Hi. Jason. Aye. Uh, Alex is an I with a <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> and I'm an I as well. Um the next uh the next one is CLU 24-12, uh, Chili Plunge for Violence Free Community at Puffers Pond. Yes, so um, some commissioners who've been with the board a little bit longer may recall, um, we've had a couple land use applications. They've tried um, several times to get this event off the ground. Um, it's been a little challenging for a variety of reasons. Um, the commission did previously approved this event in um, April of 2023, and it was planned for April of 2024. Um, I don't know why the event didn't move forward, but I think um, one of the things that the um, they were challenged by was doing it. They wanted to do it when it when it wasn't too warm, but it wasn't too cold. So um, I don't know if that played into it because we had kind of a warm April. Um, there, I'm listing the conditions that the town previously had on the um, approval for the event. The applicant already provided me with their proof of insurance, and they've already engaged with the Amherst Fire Department um, to you know, figure out how to get assistance. They've arranged um, a company that can provide porta potties already, and they're working, you know, for the other items that would be needed for the event. Great. Looks like they've done a good bit of work to try and uh, try and remedy the uh, the holes they had in it earlier. Um, I see that Alex uh, has his hand up. Uh, I just want to ask if you can hear me. We can hear you now. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, did you want, Alex, did you want to uh, comment on what you were uh, looking to comment on earlier or? Uh, okay. That's fine. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right, Bruce. Yeah. Is there any reason that we can or should require a positive um, water quality test prior to this event? Or would Dave say, well, if it's in November, it's not a problem? Yeah, so we only do water quality testing from um, Memorial Day to Labor Day. So, um, and typically the water quality issues are mostly associated with high temperatures in the pond. Um, okay. So I, I don't think that that will be as significant of an, is it, an issue as it is in the summer. Okay. Nonetheless, should we, uh, if we're not requiring a, a positive, do we have some sort of statement or something that says that they will be swimming at their own risk mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that water quality will be, we are, the, the town is not responsible for determining the water quality. I think that's a great idea, like a, like a disclaimer of some sort that says they're, you know, the town isn't conducting water quality tests at that time and that they would be basically swimming at their own risk for the event. And that 
do and do we want to put a time frame on that as well like um that if there's a rain event 24 hours prior or you know 48 hours prior to the event they may want to reconsider mm -hmm. i think having a rain date is a great idea also yeah i think that's a great idea thanks jason good points yes um, rachel please um similar to that were they talking about having a lifeguard uh on site during the event um yes i think that they're gonna have some sort of um emt and police department presence but i'll definitely um confirm that there'll be some sort of public safety um related um responders there okay any other questions all right uh let's uh just quick double check uh, anybody in the public i don't see any hands up in the public so we're looking for a motion I move that uh, we approve CLU 2412 Chili Plunge for Violence Free Community in Puffers Pond, November 16th, 24. Thank you. Uh, Could we just add the noted conditions um, that were discussed? Oh, you want me to read the whole thing? No, no, just if you could just state that it's approved with the noted conditions. Oh, approved with your the noted conditions. Second. All right, great. Uh, Bruce with the motion and Jason with the second uh, with uh, the conditions that were noted. Um, Rachel. Rachel. Aye. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. And Alex. Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. Thanks, folks. Uh, now, uh, next to the uh, fourth and last. Um, uh, land use permit application, CLU 2413, for a birth birthday party at Puffers Pond on 7-7. Yes. Um, so this is a very last minute request. Um, it, it came in today, actually, but they wanted to do the party um, this weekend. Um, it's, uh, I did speak with them about it. They're going to bring trash bags to remove their own trash. Um, they are just kind of planning a picnic for a couple family members um, to come. And um, yeah, it, it seems it seems kind of low key. Um, it, you know, it, there's porta potties already on site. Um, and the the pond is closed right now for um, swimming. So is going on with my computer <laughs> can't see you guys there you are <laughs> um what's with the date of seven seven um that's just that they originally wanted to do it last weekend and uh changed it or how did that um i think that might be a typographical error it's this sunday sorry this was right. um yeah, yeah there, it's their application form lists both dates the start date of the 14th and the end date of the 7th so i think they yeah I think Scribner's error on their end. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. They said Sunday, the Sunday. On the 14th. Okay. Um, I see Jason's got a question. Uh, are you all done? Uh, did you have anything else, Aaron? No. No. Uh, Jason? My, uh, my question was just, Aaron, you mentioned that Puffer's Pond is closed. Is that for water quality? Yes. Okay. And applications like this, um, what is what is the like if these people hadn't submitted an application and just went and did what they were doing and i don't there's no ramifications for that right and are they required like where do we no no it's it's mostly so that we know what's happening um it's mostly so we know when these events are happening and also so that we can sort of put some boundaries on it so like originally when they they were at they wanted to bring their dogs and i said oh well there's no dogs allowed at puffers and then 
um, I asked, are you planning to bring bags to take your own trash? And they said, no. And I said, well, you know, it's pack in, pack out. So you should take your trash with you, you know? So it gives us a chance to engage with people um, when they come to us with these events where we can kind of put some structure around to make sure people know what the, what the rules are. Cause it's not always clear um, to people who use some of the land, if it's not well marked or, you know, like, how do people know that they're supposed to do this? Usually people reach out via email and say, I'm planning to have a birthday party or a graduation party. I'd like to do it here or there. Um, like, there was one situation, um, it was, I believe, last spring where somebody wanted to have a um, a graduation party with, like, 60 people at Puffer's Pond. <laughs> And I talked with Dave about it before the land use application even came in. I talked to Dave about it. And Dave was like, you know, um, we referred them basically for like Mill River or Groff Park as an alternative because it's got proper facilities to handle that number of people. And they ended up going with a different facility. <laughs> so sometimes like when people initially make contact, it's it's an opportunity to let them know what other potential recreational facilities are available. Um, and then sometimes they redirect um to you know something that has a little more by way of what they're looking for um like those folks wanted they were looking for picnic tables and places to cook and stuff like that and so they just didn't know they just assumed that those things were all available at puffers which they're not so okay thanks um bruce and thus, because engagement in setting of protocols and having some interactive is the primary purpose, you're more forgiving about something that comes in the morning of the meeting. Yeah, I mean, the policy as far as like our submission policy, I consider that to be mainly for hearings, um, like hearings where we have technical details like engineering documents or you know that Fair type enough. of thing um but i also to you know usually leave that sort of to the chair to decide the one the one reason why i moved this many forward because there was four and it is summertime so sometimes in the summer we get backed up with them um and so you know just keeps them moving so that we don't end up with a backlog at the next meeting all good yeah that works that worked well um now uh let me just ask for some clarification uh, on Jason's question before. Erin, um, don't the town bylaws uh, mention something about uh, part of, uh, you know, groups over a certain amount need to have a permit? Or am I uh, imagining that? Um, the When you say the town bylaws, do you mean like our the Conservation Commission rules and regulations? Yeah. That's a that's a really interesting question. So, you know, and and this is something we can cue Alex in on as well as the chair of the land management subcommittee. But um, we're I think the answer is we're still working on um, all of those details to have it be sort of set in stone as to what those policies would be. Oh, OK. Huh. Sounds good. Noted. Hey, Laura. Hi, Laura. Um, Michelle's out uh, today, and uh, so I'm chairing today. Hi, party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. Um, well, we just went through um, uh, land use uh, application CLU 2413. That's the fourth of four. Um, I'm going to double check with the public, see if there's any anyone in the public who's looking to... Uh, if you need to, if you have anything to say or ask, uh, please raise your hand so I can take a, have you join. And I see none. Yeah. Uh, so with that, I would be looking for a, um, uh, for a motion. I move to approve the conditional land use application 2413. Birthday party at Puffer's Pond, July 14th, 2024. 
All right, we have uh, Jason with a motion and Rachel with a second. Uh, Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. So now we're uh, we're through the uh, land management updates. Um, are we going to have a uh, an update on the open space and recreation uh, plan in the public information se session? Yes. Um, so just an an update on that is that we we did set up a website. Um, the website is listed there, but if you just do a Google search for the Town of Amherst Open Space and Recreation Plan, there's a web page that has our survey results. Um, it also has our compiled results from our public information sessions that were held at Groff Park, Amethyst Brook, um, Mill River, and did I say Amethyst Brook already? <laughs> I did. Okay. Puffers, Amethyst, Mill River, and Groff Park. Um, we had four sessions. Um, and then I have been working to compile based on the survey results, the public information sessions, and also as well as the multiple meetings that we've had with town staff, our list of um, open space and recreation goals, objectives, and action items. Um, those, that document is uploaded on the town website for review and people are welcome to submit comment. Certainly tonight, people are welcome to submit public comments and I'll take those comments into consideration for the plan. I just wanna make sure that anybody who looks at the document knows that um, myself and the recreation director did just meet this week to add in a number of additional recreation goals or recreation action items rather. And so uh, probably early to middle of next week, that document will be updated with some additional recreation items, um, including like War, War Memorial Pool related, um, Mill River related recreation area. Um, so th there's there's a number of, of additional pieces that were not uh, because it, it's it's if you look at it right now, it's a little conservation centric. And the reason for that is because I've been kind of the primary author on it, but um, I'm trying to integrate commentary from other departments of what they need. So, um, but welcome to take comments, um, submit written commentary to me on it. Um, love to get public, any public um, comments on it. Um, we're hoping to sort of close the public comments by the end of July. That way we can start formalizing the plan and get it finalized. Well, great. And with that mention of the public, I'm wondering if the public has any comments. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, uh, would you please raise your hand? And this is uh, regarding land use. Uh, land use, uh, open space and recreation plan. I don't see anyone. Um, okay. Any uh Anything else from other commissioners or should we move into our uh, first hearing of the night? I guess we move into our first hearing. Um, so we're uh, we're gonna have some our hearings. Uh, the general procedure for uh, for the hearings is there's five minutes of comments uh, from uh, staff five minutes of uh, presentation by the applicant uh, or their representative, uh, five minutes of public comment or two per person, and five uh, minutes for conservation commissioners. Um, I'll say, I said it earlier at the beginning of our session today, I'll say it uh, one more time for emphasis. Uh, we require that uh, all submitted uh, documents be done uh, be submitted prior to the Wednesday uh, before our meeting. So please abide by that. Um, when you go to present or, uh, or speak as a member of the public, just be sure to clearly state your name uh, and your address um, and your preferred pronouns. Um, I think we'll leave it at that. You see, you can see the Roberts rules of order. Whatever you do, you're not uh, you're not allowed to interrupt other people. And if you're going to argue, you argue to the chair and not against other people who are in the meeting. 
All right, so now on to our first meeting. Um, first meeting is a notice of intent, uh, SWCA on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for an after the fact NOI application for the construction of a pavilion and associated site work in the Orchard Hill residential area at 152 Orchard Hill uh, Drive. Um, Aaron? Yes. Um, so, um, myself and several of the conservation commissioners gathered on the site, um, on Monday and, um, we, uh, had quite a few folks there from, um, UMass who, you know, we sort of discussed the existing site condition and, um, reviewed the, the plans, what's proposed, discussed, um, sort of the concerns of the site and um, walked the erosion control barrier to see um, what was going on as well as looking at um, the impacts to the existing stormwater infrastructure on the site. Um, overall, I have to say like, I, I don't really have a ton of concerns about the plan overall. Um, I, I like the um, uh, proposal to restore the, the stream. Um, I, think that there needs to be a larger stream crossing um, culvert installed. So right now there's a one foot, uh, 12 inch diameter um, temporary construction culvert for the access road. The proposal um, for the notice of intent came in with an eight inch um, diameter culvert for the stream, which I think is not adequate and we need to come up with something better for that um, to convey the water under the roadway. Um, I'm also very concerned about the, um, the stability of the site. And I've expressed that to the applicant. Um, I, number one, the, um, temporary stormwater construction BMPs on the site are not adequate. They're, they're breaching, um, during these heavy rainstorms that we're getting, um, and, uh, they're breaching down into the permanent stormwater infrastructure, which is a very serious problem, and um, it needs to be resolved. Um, so we need to come up with a, a more robust construction phase BMP system to um, stop that from happening. I know UMass is already working with the contractor to get them to clean out the permanent stormwater infrastructure that's been impacted, um, but we need to get them to to address that and and get the construction phase BMPs um, up to up to par, basically. The other thing that's really concerning to me is the amount of open soil on this site. It's very sloped, um, and it slopes down to the stormwater structures and also to the resource areas. Um, while no material has gone into the resource areas because there are erosion controls, I am concerned that there's too much exposed soil and that if their soil is left more than 14 days without being touched, they need to be seeded and mulched. And um, until they're worked again, they need to be stabilized in some form or fashion. Um, so those are those are kind of my comments. But just in general, I think the plan is fine. I just think that we need to kind of shore up a couple elements of it. Thanks, Aaron. Just a quick clarification. You said it's a uh, fourteen day it, within fourteen days. It needs to be uh, seeded. How long has it been out there? Um, I I think that site construction started maybe late March, early April on the site. Um, and the site has sort of slowly opened up more and more since that time. It started out that they were just working up at the top of the hill and they had the construction entrance in. But um, since that time, there's been a significant amount of work to install sewer lines and water lines, um, connect um, utility infrastructure that's underground. Um, and, you know, some of like the utility infrastructures within um, it's it's up to the 50 foot buffer boundary that that so you know there there efforts being made to stabilize that area and some of them are starting to 
um, to take, like the the area where the utilities were connections were made, um, some seed is starting to take there. But the areas where the um, water line and the um, sewer line were installed are completely exposed. And right now they're using that as a um, construction or a, uh, it's a detention pond basically. Um, and if that was stabilized, I think it would provide quite a bit more um, sort of protection of the stormwater on the site. Do you mean uh, the that's what that's that uh, retention area right next to the uh, the path? Yes. Yeah. Yep, that's where the water and sewer lines came into the site. So that wasn't open um, in early April. That was opened, I want to say, in like the last month or so. That was opened up, but it's gotten significantly worse since that was opened up. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, just sorry. Go ahead. Just a point of order. Um, Andre, it doesn't, after 14 days, it doesn't have to be seeded. It just has to be stabilized with some sort of temporary stabilization until final stabilization criteria is met. Thanks, Jason. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's uh, So now to uh, the applicants, um, if you don't mind raising your hand, I'll uh, bring you in uh, as uh here we go we have uh royushi Ta takahashi here we go who else oh we got a few jason and daddy meredith borenstein and jess vala all right um, who uh, who would like to start on uh, behalf of uh, UMass slash WCA? I would do so. Um, I don't see myself on the screen for some reason. I th um, I you'll need to hit your um, your. Uh, did you? Oh, hit, here it goes. Uh, it just you know, start at the bottom left. Bottom left. I see audio. All right. Well, uh, you don't have to have. Uh, I know, but I got all dressed up for nothing. I'm kidding. I'm still on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's funky. I don't see the uh, camera for some reason. Uh, I am Jason Venditti. I uh, met with you guys a few weeks ago. Uh, and thank you again for having us back um, uh, for this retroactive uh, notice of intent conversation. We did indeed bring with us the uh, team that we have that's working on the project. Um, Ruski Takahashi is the Simpson Associate. Uh, Amherst native, might mention, still is in Amherst. Uh, we have Jeff Walla from Niche Engineering, who could talk about further details in regard to the engineering aspects of the design. And we have Meredith Bornstein, who I think you all know from uh, SWCA. So I would, uh, I appreciate you guys taking us back into a conversation. Um, I, I think I'd like to, in general, though, start with the, uh, the open conversation about how the fact that we are indeed engaged in conversation. I did hear the comment that you had, Andre, in regard to uh, documents being produced by Wednesday prior to hearing, and we do apologize that we are uh, dynamically adjusting to new information in regard to what we're designing towards, and uh, we're open to continue that open conversation, which we very much appreciate with Erin. The SWIP conversation that took place there in regard to stormwater pollution prevention, the university, as I stated before, takes this very seriously. Uh, we have had multiple conversations uh, with this contractor in regard to mitigation measures and uh, mediation uh, regards to different um, measures that they have taken. The utility connections that they have had have been indeed open. The electrical utility has been stabilized and is in much better condition. The water lines were just recently finished. Um, those were indeed opened up, but they just recently finished. The contractor has indeed installed um, you know, detention basins on the site temporarily as a measure to allow themselves to make sure that they have uh, stormwater prevented from running off the site, which we also concur. We have challenged their stormwater pollution prevention measures in regard to waddles and et cetera. The university is well aware of that and is indeed uh, almost meeting daily with this contractor to uh, ameliorate that and are heavily engaged in the conversation. So I hope that that um, you know, uh, did you, I, I said before to you all that we take this very seriously. We take uh, stormwater pollution prevention very seriously. In fact, again, we 
even on sites that don't require SWIPs, we do the same measures that we do that even though they don't require formal SWIPs to be filed, we use the same measures. So with that, I'd really like to hand it over to Ruski because I feel as though you guys have not seen the overall um, project site and like what the intent of the project site is going to look like. So if you don't mind, Ruski, if you could take it over from Simpson Associates. Sure. Um, my name is Yosuke Takahashi, a senior associate from Simpson. Um, we are the landscape architect for this pavilion project. Um, I'd like to go through the overall design of the landscape. Would it be possible for me to share my screen? I don't see the share button. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, Aaron, I got to tell you, the, the controls look different tonight than they normally do. Normally, yeah. I see in the bottom left, I see a, a video and audio. I also usually see a share once you promote me to a, hmm. a presenter, et cetera. Yeah, if, um, we had a, a Zoom update, and that's why at the last meeting I had technical difficulties because there had been a Zoom update that hadn't been run on the desktop version. Um, so I apologize. It's a little strange. Um, but I did um, it, um, initiate that you should be able to share. Um, so let's see if that works. Um Roski should be in the in the very middle of your screen at the bottom. And yeah, I see raise hand button, show captions, show captions, button, and that's it. audio, uh, and that's it. Oh, should be at the left of your uh, raise hand. Yeah, it's not. No. Hmm. Is there something in the documents that uh, you would like that you that we could bring up? Maybe, uh, Aaron. Do you think? Do you have access? To do we plan? have copies of the plans that you wanted us to share? or that you wanted to present or are those plans um, different than what we've been provided? I think this it, one in particular is different. We okay. tried to simplify the multiple sheets that break up the site into one composite plan for ease of demonstration. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is one of the challenges um, and I don't know why it's not allowing us to share, but um, yeah, I was, wondering when I was looking through the packet why we didn't have like an overall site plan um it seems like we kind of got like a piecemeal um uh let me just see what we have in the folder Aaron while you're doing that maybe if there's anyone else on uh on the team there uh Meredith or Jess uh who might have um might have a screen sharing uh capability that uh I do not. This is Jess from Niche. Mine is also just mute lower hand and show captions. Hmm. Yeah, same here. Meredith from SWCA. Uh, yeah, this is a different format than we are used to. So it says Zoom workplace. I, that is something maybe a little different about the webinar. And I also, yeah, we can't show our videos or the... Um... All right. Well, uh, could I email you a copy of the plan we were going to present, Erin? Would that be yeah. beneficial? Yeah. I, yeah. I also submitted with the um, notice of intent. I submitted an overall um, aerial photo with like the delineation and um, just the limit of work, not the grading plans. And we did submit the utility plans, which do show the swale and the drainage area and the buffer zone um, relative to the utility proposed utilities. So that could be useful. Um, we have updated the culvert crossing since. Yeah, so this is just a general um, aerial photo of the site. It doesn't show any of the proposed work. It just shows um, current conditions prior to I just emailed you, Aaron. Sorry to cut you off, Meredith. I'm so That's sorry. I, yep. I just emailed you, Aaron. Uh, there's two sets of plans there. One is the L base color. That would be the overall plan. Probably good to start with that for this commission's benefit to see the overall project site. Okay. Bear with me just a moment. <clears throat> yeah, we could yeah. also start with this site utility plan, which does show buffers and proposed um drainage near the site access mm -hmm. uh, i'm never I, i'm never ironing for zoom again i could tell you that right now though <laughs> jess you have your hand up uh did you have something uh that you needed to that you wanted to tell us no sorry that was from earlier yeah. um so the the email has not come in yet but um i can pull up the site utility plan um just so we have something to talk about until the email comes okay. through Thank you.
So um, should I start with the, I mean, I'm. it's hard for folks to see this screen. So like, I feel like zooming in is the only way to really see it. Um, this, correct me if I'm wrong, is the parking area. And then this is the construction access road coming in. Um, this is a the proposed culvert inlet um, and uh, outlet point for the stream. Um, which the stream is not shown on here, but there is a wetland up in this location and a stream that runs down along this parking lot. Um, and then uh, this is this is the location of the water line and the um, not sure if that's the sewer line or what that what that I know there was that another is, utility. Yeah, that, that is a walkway and that uh, blue line there oh, is right. the hundred foot buffer zone. Oh, well, there's sewer. Yeah, sewers are uh, closer yeah. to the array. Yep. So, the, yeah, it kind of explains the wide swath of disturbance in this location because the lines are parallel in some locations, but further apart in others. Um, anyway, I don't want to dominate. You guys feel free to jump in, and I know it's hard with me running the controls, but feel free to present what you wish. Um, I just could probably talk to more detail in regard to the utilities, but what you're seeing there is uh, a, a water and domestic and a fire line that is going to feed a um, facility that is up the hill that does indeed have restrooms, that does indeed have sprinklers. Um, it is an outdoor air facility that has restrooms associated with it. Uh, the access path that uh, Aaron mentioned is 20 feet wide in coordination with the Amherst Fire Department in regard to it being a fire lane, but it also is going to serve as the handicap access to the site so it's an ADA accessible route all the way to the site itself. The water lines, as mentioned, are shown there, that outside line that you see that's kind of hard to read the text on, but that outer, um, you know, ISO line there is the 100 foot buffer zone. Uh, this one is just barely inside that 100 foot buffer. Um, if you want to go to the next page, Aaron, you'll be able to see the, the electrical utility, which is uh, definitely closer. It's on the bottom of that page. So same ISO line on the bottom of that page. It's hard to see there, but in the middle of the screen, there is an electric line that comes from an existing manhole. Excuse, and, excuse me, Jason, just one minute. Just a point yes. of order here. Anyone sure. who's not uh, speaking, uh, would you please uh, mute your uh, microphones? Thank you. Go ahead, Jason. My apologies. So, yeah, so that is an electrical manhole that was existing. Um, what the project is doing is installing new duct bank or has installed already new duct bank. Aaron referred to the fact that that slope, uh, mostly across that main path, that first section right where her mouse is now, has indeed been seeded and is taking. Um, still what uh, still on the radar in regard to some erosion control measures still warranted to be amended, uh, as that is indeed a 50-foot ISO line there for the buffer line. So that one is definitely on their radar in regard to that's one of the reasons they um, seeded that very quickly up compared to the rest of the site. So actually on the north side of the screen there, I'm sorry, they can actually see the uh, site itself in re regard to what it is. And I wish uh, I did hopefully that email went through, Aaron, because the uh, the graphic that we have kind of conveys the overall site um, gist. And I didn't want to do any injustice to it. So um, I would say, uh, you know, it, it, in general, though, it's a very green site. It looks like a lot of hardscape. The site looks very big. It took a lot of grading in order to come up to ADA grades in New regard to make it fully accessible. And coming off the parking lot is very laminar in regard to approach to allow ease of access. The walkways that were shown on that plan, a lot of them are actually just mowed paths. They're existing um, paths that are, or excuse me, they're existing meadow grass up there that we're going to amend by mowing low. Again, this plan doesn't show it to be the landscape plan, but that's all right. Um, so in, in general, though, it's a, this does not convey. This looks like a general typical uh, engineering drawing that you see. This is one of the engineering plans, but the landscape plan would convey more. Um, and that isn't that set. But so, Aaron, did my email has, not go through to you? It, uh, can you guys hear me? Sorry, I can't see if I'm muted or not. Um, it's yep. not come in yet. I'm keeping okay. my eye out, though. Um. With all new mouse. Okay. Um, let's say sent. Let me try it again. Yeah. So I again, I think uh, Aruski's uh, overall description of the site, even verbally with a landscape plan. Oh, there we go. 
Yep, bear with me. I can't open anything until I close this. So hold on one second. Yeah, Ruski, I don't know if you could take control after this and kind of walk through the overall sure. plan. Again, for the commission's benefit, I think that'd be uh, helpful. Bear with me just one second while I open these and get the screen back sharing again. Um, so which one did you want to start with? Uh, this one would be great. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, um, as you can see in the middle, um, you can see the footprint of the pavilion. So that's roughly 100 by 25 feet, uh, which itself is an open air sort of piece of art um, architecture. And that provides a space for gathering and various kinds of events and the landscape design supports the function of the pavilion and enhances the outdoor experience of this place and the woods on the west side which is um, page upside um, are the oldest woods of the campus while this site has a history as an orchard and we uh, during the design phase we found an existing terraced area and use that as a concept by creating this series of uh, terraces to inherit the uh, history and provide space for people to gather, walk through, rest, and enjoy the view toward the Mount Toby to the north. And um, as Jason mentioned, the main access to the pavilion consists of um, permeable asphalt and reinforced turf, uh, beginning uh, at the Lot 49 parking uh, on the left hand, hand side of the page. And that serves as an ADA access as well as fire access. And the site is uh, pretty sloped um, and the regrading was necessary to provide ADA access from the parking and also a flat area for gathering and events and all that. And the, in order to make the uh, flat area, the retaining wall is kind of making an arch behind the pavilion. And um, that accommodates five bathrooms and some equipment rooms embedded in the hill. And the storm water from the uphill side and the roof of the pavilion are all captured and that flows through the swells running parallel to the uh, walking path um, and arcing the, behind the pavilion. Um, yeah, thank you for zooming in. So you can see that um, call out for swell running parallel to the uh, walking paths on either side. And um, um, you know, that those wells visualize the stormwater management and also provide experiential, experiential effects like sound and visual effect and all that. So, and uh, the water eventually goes to the bioretention basin um, to the right, if you can pan right. Yep. So the end of the swell is um, connected to the um, the basin with pipe underground. And uh, we are providing a minimum amount of payment, as you can see, and most areas will be fully vegetated by lawn, uh, middle type native perennials are good for pollinators, uh, shrubs and trees, um, including some crab apples to respect the history of the orchard. And if you could switch to the other PDF. Yes, so um, this is the area in question, right um, adjacent to the lot 49 on the north side, um, where the stream is uh, visible. And for this area, um, part of the commission's directions, we are proposing to have two to three inch river rocks along the stream and uh, for two feet wide and plant sensitive fern and cinnamon fern on either side of the strain by three feet and um, also to make a nice threshold between the parking and the stream we we also plant sedges for four feet so that's the um, gist of the overall landscape plan and also the um, area for this area
again, without in having the ability to present, my apologies, but uh, without having to present, I've, I don't know if Jess would like to uh, discuss in regard to like the sizing of the culvert and, you know, it, Aaron, you had a comment there in the beginning of your um, presentation there in regard to the size. So it's unfortunate we can't bring up pictures of it because it showed the contributing area of that, but, um, oh. and Jess, I don't know if you could describe it verbally for this commission. Um, yeah, is was the memo that um, pipe sizing memo part of what you just emailed to Aaron? I just yeah. sent, I just sent Aaron the most updated plan and the memo. I didn't want to overwhelm her before the, right before the hearing, so I hadn't sent that, and we just got it in. So perhaps that would be helpful to share. Now, Aaron, two more documents are coming your way: um, an up to date utility plan that shows a twelve inch drainage pipe, and then Niche put together a memo with the calcs and the. Um, uh, contributing area, some nice figures in there that may help, um, that would help explain the 12 inch, um, pipe that would be installed in the drainage area. So that I just emailed over. Um, yep. Yeah. I think the memo would be the more helpful one once that does come through. Great. Okay. Uh, Jess and Meredith, it looks like, uh, Bruce has a question. Uh, Bruce, why don't you go ahead with your question? So since these are brand new materials that weren't delivered within a, a day, let alone a week, um, and we are continuing this in any case, perhaps we could, and we could give us two weeks to solve the, whatever the Zoom mystery is, um, that we should let that go for now and move on to wrapping this up and then have a more formal discussion where the, Maya, the uh, applicants can actually present what they want to present. That's my suggestion. Bruce, I think that's a really good suggestion. It's uh, kind of hard to uh, hard to follow the way things are right now, and part of it's uh, part of it's on this uh, on the program that we're using, the Zoom, and uh, part of it uh, due to the timeliness. So, thanks for your suggestion. I, I agree with you, Aaron. Yeah, so I really appreciate the um, engineering calculations and thank you so much for putting something together to get some response to me. I guess I just wanted to speak in general related to this feature. Um, I understand that this is a severely degraded system that has been impacted by years of impact from building of parking lots, moving of soil, putting in lawn seed, mowing, using it as a snow storage area, et cetera. Um, this has been shown as a hydrologic feature on our maps um, going back for some period of time. You can see it on aerial imagery going back some period of time. It's clear that this has been a altered resource. I reviewed it with DEP and DEP does think that this is a jurisdictional resource under mass regulations so that the wetland um, is a wetland that is the um, contributing source of water for the stream which flows down the hill. I understand that you're saying that the that the um, culvert only needs to be eight inches to accommodate the the watershed, but I can tell you from a resource area standpoint, me as as a staff person, I will not be able to support this application with an eight inch culvert going underneath that access road. I don't think it is um, I've, I have never seen a, a stream in 2024 try to be put through a eight inch pipe. I, I have not seen in the last 20 years a stream try to get put through an eight inch pipe. To me, that is something that somebody would have done a hundred years ago. Um, and it's just, we need to do better. I hope we can do better than that. Um, I just want to comment on that. And, and I agree that we should give the commission a chance to review the updated materials and continue the discussion. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I think, I think I'd like to hold off the rest of the questions of our uh, commissioners until the, uh, the end of the presentation, um, unless there's something that uh, that's, uh, that's urgent. Uh, and then in other words, until the end of the presentation by the, uh, uh, by, by the applicants. Thank you, folks. All right, uh, Jess or Jason uh, or whoever's uh, next, why don't you go ahead? 
Um, I'm not sure where we go from here. I think we, uh, if it's a guaranteed um, continuance, I am not sure procedurally how we do this. Is it a continuance at our protocol in regard to inability to present? No, you can, uh, you know, the, the people who make the call on uh, whether we're going to continue it or not is going to be uh, us. But at this point, it doesn't seem that uh, the materials that you wanted to present on are not all of them. And that you have uh, submitted, um, we haven't had a chance to review them. So, uh, they're, they're, you know, it wouldn't make any sense for us to sit here and review them while uh, while we're talking um, in order to come up with uh, uh with a, a decision okay uh, yep. hearing, jason so it it will be continued uh perhaps it's better to uh, go ahead and do that uh yeah now. my apologies i was asking andre i didn't know the procedure i'm sorry about that i didn't know the procedure no, i thought if i had to request that continuance or not i'm sorry thank you yep i'm sorry i didn't know if i was the one who had to request that continuance or how that works i just didn't know my apologies it's all right um, so, but if, uh, there was anything else that you wanted to, uh, say, I see that Meredith, uh, has her hand up. Why don't you go ahead, Meredith and Jess and later first Meredith. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to, um, ask if there were any other questions from the commission at this time that we would want to consider, bef um, so we can go back to the drawing board. I just wanted to hear from other folks to make sure we're going to address all the issues. So when we come back in two weeks, um, it's a more complete package. So that was my only comment. And I totally agree we should continue um, so when we can all present a little easier. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Meredith. Yes, it is. Uh, I think it is uh, kind of hard for us to uh, have all the questions uh, that we've got without uh, reviewing the materials, but uh, uh, we'll go ahead with some, uh, with, we'll go ahead and start asking some questions here as soon as you guys are done, okay? Jess? Thank you. This maybe should be tabled for the continuance. Um, I'll just quickly say, so in the revised memo that we sent, we upsized it to a 12 inch and that was sized to convey the 100 year storm upstream. And this is going to be hard to explain without the graphics. So maybe this again is tabled for later. No, 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 but Table it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for the uh, interruption there. Okay. No, that's all right. Thank you, Jess. Um, Anything, anyone else from the uh, uh, from the presenter uh, side? Okay, Jess, you can uh, put your hand down now. Jason? Thank you, uh, Andre. Thank you, everybody. So I want to clarify something very, I think, <laughs> needs to be clarified. Uh, we're talking about a stream. I assume we're talking about the stream on the was it south side that is labeled as a swale? Is that correct? Yes. So is it a stream or is it a swale? Oh, that was a big discussion. So it, it's a, <laughs> it's been a big discussion. Um, and for so, those, sorry, and sorry, Aaron, for those <laughs> of us that weren't involved in any yeah. of it. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> when I was there for the first time in April, it was flowing and it was probably, I want to say, 16 inches wide flowing down through the pipe. Um, I immediately thought this is a stream. I walked upstream and saw a wetland. That was one of the main triggers for the need for this permit. Um, and that was prior to all the disturbance that's down in the buffer zone that's now underway. Um, I do believe it's a stream and I do believe that that wetland that's upstream is jurisdictional and that these are jurisdictional under state law. We have had a big discussion about that, I think, maybe some professional disagreement with the applicant about whether or not that's jurisdictional under state law. They believe that it may be jurisdictional under the bylaw. We've had some back and forth and reviewing it and considering it. So it has not been delineated or included on the plan as a quote unquote resource area as part of this application. Okay. So um, in the material that we have in the utility plan, the aerial is from 2021 when was the delineation done then for this project um well i don't know if uh, meredith is still on here i don't see i can't see people again but uh we were tasked after with the fact that we had the retroactive buffer zone work 
uh, we walked off site with Aaron, and I must admit that the first time we met on site, um, th this is an area that is a grass uh, fairly level mode area that is north of an existing parking lot that has indeed undergone growth over the last 30 years. It was upgraded 20 something years ago. And then I actually don't have the date of when the solar canopy was amended to put above it. Uh, this area falls underneath the canopy itself, the solar canopy. And the aerial that is best used for that is one that shows prior to the canopy going up. So it's semi predated because it shows the parking lot geometry it does not show the current condition because it's under the array. So you wouldn't be able to see it because it's under a solar canopy. So that's the backdating of um, orthophotogrammetry. The second part of that is uh, it's, we could talk a lot about what this is on site and it probably does warrant in another site investigation and visit, but you know, even to the naked eye, this appears to be to most people. And I must admit that I thought the same. This is a grass area that was uh, designed by the expansion of the parking lot to be a 10 foot wide snow storage area. So this is directly adjacent to the parking lot. And it was intended to be a grass area that they could push snow onto to allow them to have snow melt not be done in the parking lot to not take up spaces. So I hear Aaron's comment in regard to that it's been amended over the years and the iteration to get to that is something that warrants discussion. Um, but, you know, for most, it, it, it looks to, it appeared to us in, as a naked eye that it looked there was a more of a snow storage slash grass belt, you know, and act semi as a swale. The carve line in the center of that photo is twofold created, uh, maybe threefold considering it might be flow, but um, they, you mass mowed that with a, a mower that is approximately 36 inches wide. And that's the uh, track of the center tires that they go back and forth across. And it also happens to be under, if you guys ever do solar canopies, uh, you should note this, um, a silicone caulking between the canopy pieces, they're referring to the array pieces, would be beneficial because that is a drip line, exactly dead center of that swale that we calling, uh, that Aaron's calling a stream, is exactly the drip line of uh, one of the canopy pieces. So it's dual fold in regard to loading, but um, without having metrics up uh, in modeling and without having Meredith contribute towards uh, flagging. But again, we did not see that as a resource initially in regard to the uh, project itself. And, you know, figured that was a drainage swale created by the parking lot construction to allow snow melt to happen. Uh, th yeah, and that is a pretty low spot. I've been up to that area a number of times. You know, there's there's fairly steep slopes around it. Right. Um, there's a on the swale markup twenty four zero six one eight that we have in our packets. There's also a four inch porous pavement under drain just north right. of the. You know, if you're looking at it, the three right. seventy four call out. What yep. what is that porous pavement under drain for? What is it draining, and where is it draining to? Jesse and or uh, Ruski, would you like to pick up? I can address that. Um, so that access from the parking lot up to the pavilion is a porous pavement with a reinforced turf shoulder. Um, so because I mean as I think we're all witnessing, the soil conditions aren't great here. Um, that porous pavement, we determined does need an under drain. Um, so that under drain is just below the porous pavement section and where it connects to is actually along that access drive. Um, there's a few area drains that we're proposing on the west, so page north side of the access drive, just so that runoff that's coming down that vegetated slope gets collected instead of sheet flowing over the porous pavement. So those are pipes that, uh, there'll be area drains with pipes below the access drive, that outlet on the other side of the access drive down the slope, and that under drain will connect it to one of those um, solid 12 inch CPP pipes. Yeah, I'm not, I don't, I don't I, think I, I'm seeing that. Yeah, so uh, in summary, because I asked the same question the first time Aaron and I met with that uh, team out on site. So the uh, the intent is that in order to have a fire lane access, it has to be 20 feet wide. Um, Stimson Associates felt as though that would domineer the site in not too many words. I'm putting words in their mouth as landscape architects, but they didn't want that to be 
a big access 20 foot wide access drive it doesn't warrant that so it is a um fourth pavement in the center with grass on the sides of it that's a reinforced turf so if a fire truck does need to pull in there it's reinforced so the fire truck doesn't sink in but uh, again it's, i don't know if you ever can pull up that sketch it does show that um the center pipe but the 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 four inch under drain system you're talking about is actually, we have started doing that ourselves. Whenever you use porous pavement, it's a good idea to have an under drain system put under that as not belt and suspenders. It's just get the water from out being from underneath the porous asphalt. Yeah. So I understand that. I'm talking about uh, if you're looking at this, this exhibit here, it's to the left of the main access road and it appears there's a call out for it so either the, either it's in the wrong place or there's some sort of i don't know if that's a discharge end of it that will be discharging into this swale slash stream no i don't know do you have the ability to share potentially are you able to see my screen Yes. That's coming. Yes. This is, I'm asking about this right here. Oh, that's, um, I think what happened there is that's from my plans that got referenced into Rosky's plan. So that's just not the correct location that sometimes happens with. Um, yep. All right. That's fine. Different scales in uh, AutoCAD. I wanted to make sure there was no discharge coming into this potential resource. Mm, yeah. So sorry. to see the dash line, area. yeah, that is the four inch CPP that's underneath the center of that gray area in the center. That's where that leader should be shown. This is mm -hmm. what it's calling out, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, definitely chaotic error. Sorry okay. about that. Thank you. And then I just, <laughs> my last question is just um, you mentioned crab apples to honor the orchard uh, history of it. Is yes. there a reason why you're going with crab apples and not something? edible more ed more edible um we we talked about the potential of more edible um actual orchard um but the umass already has an orchard so we didn't necessarily um you know, end up having actual edible fruits and um it's also um you know requires maintenance so um instead of having actual edible fruits uh, we sort of um represent the idea of the orchard with crab apples. Okay, and there's no concern about them falling on the ground and just rotting and attracting animals, anything like that, potentially getting into the stormwater? Uh, we didn't discuss that, um, uh, but we have seen some wildlife already before the um, construction, so um, we didn't necessarily think that as a um, concern. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, Jess, did you want to uh, uh, say something? No. Sorry. Hey, Sorry. Hey, I was okay. to hey, I'll keep calling out, calling, calling you uh, if your hand's up. <laughs> um, Rachel. Uh, thanks. Um, I just wanted uh, just to say that I, I, I want to know more about your project and what we typically would see in a submission, so proposed grading plans, um, existing condition plans, your erosion and sediment control plans would be really helpful. I walked the site um, and was looking at your straw waddles, just wondering about your strategy as a whole, and that's hard to review with the limited set of information we have today. That's all. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so yeah, if you can uh, provide uh, provide a little bit more documentation, that would be great. Yeah. Will do. And we did get the um, we did get the uh, SWIP reports done by the contractor over, um, and those were raw. In fact, we didn't even. Uh, it's a matter of um, we wanted transparency in regard to what was being collected by the contractor. But yes, we can provide further details in that. That's a fair comment, Rachel. And also soils information. And you said the soils were bad. That it would be really helpful to know, like this groundwater an issue and and what's happening. All right. Thanks, Rachel and Jason. Alex. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. A couple of procedural questions. 
um, and I was on the site view, site visit. I'll just say that it is a challenging site. It's all on a hillside. Um, while we were there, uh, it was right after several rainstorms, and the sheet erosion is, uh, the entire site is scarified on the hillside. And the contractor's doing the best he can to control water. But the sheet erosion is taking as much as four inches of soil in places and moving it down the hill to a detention pond and breaching um, the temporary dams that were put in there to try and, and they just. Um, so I thought we would come to this meeting with some action for us other than a continuance to comment on what can be done now, not two weeks from now, to uh, contr better control erosion. And um, not a criticism of the contractor, but um, it was it, it, the amount of erosion is, is all the silt fences are bulging and there are leaks. Um, um, so I thought we might have some almost an emergency action to uh, pass and uh, it didn't we don't have one. So I I. I I feel uncomfortable going uh, to a continuance without saying something about uh, controlling that erosion better. I know most of, most of the erosion is not in a resource area, but it is all headed downhill towards the resource area. And in fact, uh, um, the detention pond is is cloudy. It's not clear water. It's, uh, so that's one thing. The other procedural question I have, and forgive me, is probably a very good answer that I don't know. Why are we dealing with an after the fact? Uh, why didn't this come in earlier um, so that we could be talking about this project a long time ago um, and some of these erosion issues could have come up? Uh, I, I, I'm... I'll just ask, why is this an NO? Why is this an after the fact? I can address that. The good comments. Okay. Wait a minute, Jason. Good question, um, I, I had the same question. You know, what is, uh, I want to know when the work was started and when we were, uh, when we've received uh, this NOI. Um, I didn't look at the uh, dates on it, but uh, I w I'd like to know why. Yes, Did yep, that is fair. As, uh, I, as I spoke with you um, a few weeks ago, the the campus has uh, had the assumption that the resources that are there, one, were further away than what we now know they are, but we, at the time, thought that we we're just barely outside of buffer zone work, and therefore we're in compliance with doing this work without having any notification. Since then, we have had SWCA flagged resources and indeed realized that we are within um, you know, 90 feet, 95 feet of buffer for the waterline and 50 feet for that one section of electrical duct bank. Uh, at that time, by the way, just completely separate from the swale being a stream or stream being a swale, we had thought that this was work that could have been, if not procedurally done by our comprehensive maintenance notice of intent as for utility upgrades and maintenance. But more importantly, we actually thought they were further away from the resources than they are now. So it is a procedural uh, error on the university's part. And we acknowledge that, I acknowledged that last meeting and I am aware of that. We're aware of that and we are not going anywhere. We will continue to have these open conversations with Aaron and your group um, as we move forward. So I, I comprehend and understand and actually feel that emotion of like why we're hearing about us all now and here you are trying to pull up documents that are being emailed during a meeting and it seems very uh, contrary to normal procedural operations for our standard NOI and I acknowledge that this is indeed a retroactive notice of intent and uh, again further conversations probably warranted in regard to the metrics and engineering that's involved in it, etc but again the university had uh, what we had thought was outside of the buffer zone. And if we were indeed in a buffer zone, thought it was incidental work. The duck bank is the closest duck bank we have. It's the closest to the utility do we have to that. 
So if it were not for the water line and or the duck bank, we thought we were in complete compliance with uh, WPA and town bylaws. So it's uh, we are remiss in regard to our procedural fault on that and have acknowledged that and I acknowledge it still. So well, a fair you. comment. Yeah. Thank you for uh, your straightforwardness there, Jason. Um, um, who in the university would have um, been the person to make that decision then uh, as far as uh, who, who assumed that the resources were further away? Well, it's a disturbed area. We have that walkway, that north-south path that we call the Pear Trail. Um, we barely crossed that. Uh, and the thought at the time was that, you know, that had been put in. It was permitted at the time, and that was barely buffer when that was installed. So most of the work is indeed uh, west of that. So therefore, almost the entire project site is outside of jurisdiction. Again, separate from what is happening on the north end of the parking lot, which is, again, conversation uh, further warranted. But the, I will call them incidental utility connections that we have, again, it's probably 95 feet away from the water line is where the uh, resources are. And I do acknowledge, we do acknowledge that the duck bank is indeed coming out of that. It's one thing that showed up on the plans that kind of throws people off is that the dig is small. It looks like a big duck bank in that entire buffer zone, but it's actually only a connection to the building, one straight connection. And again, that area, out of all the stuff we've seen SWIFT management-wise, is actually semi-established, which is good because that's the closest to the resource that we have. So, Okay. Uh, J Jason, I'm sorry, but I don't really know. Uh, you said you were the landscape architect uh, for this project? I'm a project executive in uh, design and construction management. We have a group of four of us here. Um, Tim uh, Bruschi is the project manager in PX on that project. I uh, was out on medical leave for a long time of last year and used to handle a lot of these conversations with commission and agents and both had the and UMass. Uh, mm -hmm. And since my return, I look forward to redeveloping relationships and uh, re reopening channels of communication. So we don't have to have uh, these things happen retroactively. In fact, we want to come in before we have a glimmer of what the project site plan looks like and say, hey, we have an idea of doing this in this location. And here's what we're thinking about doing is our intent. And again, I mentioned last time I was with you folks that uh, our new director that we have, um, we have a David also, uh, David Dower and I met with Aaron and David Zomack to formalize that open channel communication with our intent. And uh, again, acknowledge the fact that the university fell in this and procedurally were glad that we have not impacted the actual resource itself. This is not a case of um, resources being directly impacted. Buffer zone is impacted. Work is happening. Uh, SWIP management is a challenge for us on this site, et cetera, et cetera. But it is a procedural fault, not a okay. egregious or, you know, we're not trying to pull the wool over anything. But I'm, I'm back and we're we're here to stay. So. Okay, Jason, thank you. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, as far as, you know, back to Alex's point, uh, one of his points, um, you know, he was, he's, he mentioned his concern over erosion and uh, the fact that, uh, you know, in his, he's thinking that uh, there should be something uh, done immediately. Now, let me just point something out. I mean, uh, just up to this uh, minute, perhaps, um, we haven't seen, at least according to uh, uh, to Aaron, we haven't seen any uh, anything wash out into the resource area um, from your retention pond and so on. But if we get uh, enough of a rain, um, that could happen. And um, if it does, and you guys haven't done anything uh, between, you know, haven't done anything immediately, you guys are going to be uh, subject to uh, potential uh, enforcement action. Um, I yes. Just, I think it's mm -hmm. important for you to understand that. And uh, that's where, you know, uh, the enforcement action is kind of like a, a, a last uh, minute, you know, a, a last resort. Uh, we don't want enforcement action. What we want is to make sure that stuff doesn't get into the, uh, you know, that we don't get any pollutants into going into the resource area. Yeah, so, and we we share that stewardness. We completely concur. Um, so, so then, um, that's that's what Alex is uh, uh, 
uh, point was about, you know, maybe we need to do something to ensure that this doesn't happen. Is there something that you can do, uh, Jason? We have done, yes. Um, first part, and my apologies, um, since my return to work, my attitude towards uh, everyday life has changed. So just to be clear, uh, we know when it's going to rain. Uh, we, we actually know empirically when it's going to rain. It's when Aaron is coming to the site for a site visit. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So what we are doing is waiting for Aaron to schedule the next visit. And that's when, no, I'm joking. <laughs> So uh, we walked the site with Alex and Bruce and Aaron on Monday. Over the weekend, almost 5.2 inches of rain fell. Some of that rainfall rate, which I also mentioned to you last time that we have a study that's going on discussing Cam Brook coming in with empirical uh, hyper-local data in regard to what storms really are in our local area and what that means and what we're designing towards, which is why when we talk about the memo, whether a 12 inches is big enough or not, we'll talk about more. And again, I can't wait to show you guys that overall intent that we have. It's not a project yet. It's a, a, a concept and ideas that we'd like to share with the town uh, in regard to how we move forward on Tambrook management, how we manage the pond, et cetera. So with that being said, we had just had uh, basically a 200 year storm over the weekend. We then meet in the morning. No site work was ongoing other than managing SWIP features. They were going through and reestablishing waddles. They were raking out, changing silt facts. They were raking out areas. That's all they were doing that Monday morning. And it was not because of the reflection of, oh, we had a CONCOM meeting. What was interesting about it is the contractor had forgotten that. So lo and behold, here we are walking the site and damage is done to waddles. Silt fence fences have been breached and blown over. Their detention pond had surcharged over the edge there and surcharged of the stone. On and on and on and on. So we are well aware of that. The contractor, uh, it's it's one thing to say they're doing their best and it's another to say that you can't fault the contractor or point fingers it is it's their site to manage it's in their contract to manage they they are going to have to manage it so post that walk multiple meetings have taken place with that contractor and the design team to support that effort uh, in regard to what other measures could be in installed what other measures could be put in place um, what area of the site can be closed up and seated and et cetera et cetera so you know, all the options that we typically see for what can be done for road control measures, you know, the goal is to try to implement those in those areas where we can. So the contractor, I don't want to say they're just aware of it because that's not enough. Awareness isn't enough. You got to actually do action. And they have since done, when we walked that site with Alex, Bruce, and Aaron, they have already implemented a lot of the measures that we pointed and said, you should do this. You should do that. How about improving this? Change this to that. And they have done that. So they provided us a memo of what they have done to date and where they're heading for the rest of the week. Um, we decided that uh, it was not necessarily ready to send over to Erin as an update to her script comments because her comments are valid and we wanted to review it as in, is this enough? We don't want to send something over that seems just, uh, oh, we're doing it because you're making us. We want it to be that the contract is engaged in the process. And it, so far they have been, but it's been daily meetings since. You know, it's, we're, the contract is aware, we're aware, and I'm not saying an enforcement measure is something that would solve the problem, but it's the contractors are aware. We are well aware. They are leveraging campus infrastructure to manage their stormwater and forget whether or not resources are protected. We are, uh, we have concern about that as a campus. We don't like to leverage our campus infrastructure, whether it be directly catch basins and deep sumps. You know, in that area along that path, there are infiltration basins. There are perforated pipe systems that we don't want silts getting into. So. We are aware of it too, separately from resource protection. It's in addition to that. So, and again, we have a memo that came from um, the contractor that, again, we've reviewed briefly, but we, again, here we are talking about not sending off materials too close to a meeting, but we can share that next time in a more formal way. Um, we'll share with Erin prior to, so she has a chance to review it also, and you and your packages, I assume. All right. Great. Well, thank, thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. Now, Jess's uh, hand is up. Jess, did you uh, want to speak? Sorry. Yep. Just a little detail on um, Jason. I feel silly to mention all this after everything you said, but just a little bit of the detail that we got from Suffolk today because we met with them to prepare for this meeting to see what they've done since that Monday site visit. And they have made improvements and then we met with them today to recommend additional improvements such as erosion control blankets um mulch or hydro seating and that's actually part of their plan um but just a very quick summary is that they we they had 
seen areas where there's a gap below the silt fence in the ground. And so they remediated that by actually keying the silt fence into the ground by six inches. They've replaced a lot of the waddles. Um, it made additional recommendations. They, um, and then when we met with them today, we talked about hydro seeding those areas that are largely exposed and they're gonna prioritize doing the permanent um, plantings at the Northern part of the site. And we recommended some more robust waddles than the straw ones because those just are not holding up. So some of the the manufacturer name is called Pig, I think. But as long as those are acceptable to the commission, um, they're going to look at purchasing those in place. And in the areas where there's the existing catch basin near the resource area, they're going to put those more robust waddles around the perimeter there. So it's not just relying on the filter fabric. Thank you, Jess. Um, now we are going to have another, we are going to end up, yep, I got you, Bruce, in one second. Uh, we are going to end up uh, continuing this uh, till next week, so I don't really want to spend a whole lot more time. We haven't had any uh, questions or comments from the uh, public yet, so we'll do that after these uh, next two questions. Um, and with that, uh, Bruce, why don't you go ahead? You're, you're mute. I just want to ask Mr. Takahashi to reconsider the, the point that Jason made about edible um, orchard trees. There is at least one pear tree that you've protected that is from the previous orchard that's near the entrance, and there may be more, I, I don't know. Secondly, if you could comment in a couple of weeks about how you're going to address the sheet erosion that Alex has emphasized, because that means you're losing a huge amount of topsoil. Whatever topsoil was there has been lost. And so how are you gonna address all of that, replacing all that, probably at a bigger scale than the original plan called for? I don't need an answer now, but I'd like to hear about it next week. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks. Alex? Are we meeting next week? <laughs> Two weeks from now. <laughs> right. Sorry, I thought I better check my calendar. Um, but Bruce keeps the minute, so I thought he was, you know, anyways, um, our jurisdiction is the wetlands. And we didn't actually venture all that far from the parking lot where the solar is. We didn't walk out, you know, where the pavilion is going to be. And, and we walked at the bottom of the slope. So what I saw uh, wasn't the entire project. So given that, I'll just say that all of the silt fencing and wattles were at the bottom of the hill. So this, this it's a tough site. It is a slope. And it is in it, it looked to me the entire thing has been scarified. It, the entire slope is is bare. And the, the erosion control is at the bottom of the slope. And I wonder if it might not be possible to do some work mid-slope uh, to try and slow the water that's that's moving down the slope and causing the sheet erosion. Uh, just an idea. Um, I, like I said, we didn't walk the whole slope, and that's out of our jurisdiction. But uh, uh, waiting, putting your catch mitt at the bottom of the slope is uh, is is one strategy. But if you could do something to control water on its way down the slope, maybe that's worth considering. Just a suggestion. Thank you, Alex. All right, uh, Jason, why don't you go ahead and then I'm gonna ask the public. Okay, thank you. Um, the, to, I'd like to make something of a point of, the, the silt fence and the straw bottles are sediment controls. It looks like there are no erosion controls on the project from the photos that we've gotten. So as this is the silt fence, the straw waddles, they're sediment controls. They're meant to catch sediment that has already been eroded. They're not meant to prevent erosion. Something like a straw blanket, hydraulic mulch, temporary seating, those are erosion controls. Um, so, you know, to Alex's point, erosion controls are not just a good idea, they're required. And if the project has a SWIP, um, 
that ought to all be outlined in the SWIT. There needs to be some sort of temporary erosion controls because this is a very this is a challenging site. It's got a lot of slopes. There's very clearly a lot of soil that's eroded and collected in what seems to be the area where biofiltration basin number one is going to be, which also then leads me to, you know, it's fine to use those post-construction BMPs as temporary construction BMPs, but then they have to be dipped out. They have to make sure that the infiltration that was originally designed is still there because now you have a bunch of soil in them that wasn't originally there, compacting the underlying soil, potentially mixing clay soils on top of it. Uh, so erosion controls are incredibly important and they seem to be completely absent. And I would like to, uh, it's something of a professional bugaboo that I have, uh, set it, silt fence, straw waddles, compost socks, those are all sediment controls. They're not erosion controls. Hydraulic mulch, uh, blankets of some sort, um, hydro seed, temporary vegetative cover, those are the erosion controls. And those are the number one BMP that should be used to prevent soil from moving. The sediment controls are only there as I'm going to say something of a last resort to catch the sediment before it leaves your site. So, um, yeah, I would really, I really would like to make sure that reiterate that we see the slip for this project as well. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Um, and Jason Vendetti, uh, uh, no need for an answer, but maybe you guys can talk to uh, talk to the contractor about that a little bit uh, as well. Because yeah, as yeah, as Jess pointed out, that a meeting started immediately after the walk. They had a meeting yesterday, and they had a more formal meeting today, where those exact measures that you discussed, such as that is exactly brought to their attention in regard to what was in the plans, what's in the SWIP. You know, obviously the uh, SWIPs cover all sorts of options, and NIT was able to provide direct feedback in regard to this would work best in this situation, this would work best in that situation. Still a dynamic conversation, which is why we didn't want to submit it yet, um, considering we got it this afternoon. Um, so good comments, though. Yes, we, we concur. Look forward to seeing that, Jason. Yep. All right, thank you. All right, if there's any member of the public who would like to uh, ask any questions or make any comments, would you please uh, raise your hand? Going once. David's iPhone. Okay. Uh, when you uh, when you go to speak, please uh, state your name, address, and uh, your preferred pronouns. Thank you. Go ahead, David's iPhone. My name is uh, David Dow. I'm the uh, executive director of uh, campus planning. Um, in design and construction at UMass. Um, I'm the David that Jason referred to. Um, we completely hear all the comments you've made tonight. Are you all comfortable? Two weeks is a lifetime on this project. Are you guys comfortable with us working directly with Aaron on really your immediate concerns um, so we can just keep things going and, and avoid any more issues going down the road. I just want to uh, confirm that you guys are comfortable with that, um, particularly around some of these erosion control measures and things like that. We'd rather get, if if, if something's necessary, it's probably necessary now, and, and we don't want to wait two weeks for people to say, yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I just want to kind of clarify. And I, did, and I do want to reiterate what Jason said. We hear you loud and clear. Um, we're committed to working through this issue. We apologize for putting us all in this position. But but we are here and, and we just want to find our way through it. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Dave. We will get through this. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I you know, and as far as uh, working directly with uh, Aaron, I think that's the kind of the the that's the standard uh, between meetings um so 
yeah, I don't, I don't see an issue if, uh, unless Aaron has any uh, issues with it and, um, what we're looking for, uh, and I, and I appreciate your, uh, your, uh, wanting to get things addressed ASAP as well, because yeah, we don't want to be trying to make up for something that, um, uh, that went wrong. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to talk to, uh, Aaron, um, uh, as long as Aaron's all with that and Aaron's nodding her head. So, uh, yeah, that, we're all good with that, David. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, is there anyone, can you, uh, put your hand down now and I'll, uh, take a look and see who else is, uh, might have their hand up. Okay. I don't, we don't have anyone else. Um, Alex, one last question. Go ahead. We can't hear you. Would it be appropriate for us to quickly put together a motion uh, that they address uh, to, to put in some formal way for our minutes what we've discussed about taking care of erosion control and and have them and say in the motion to have them work with Aaron on that. Um, and I don't I haven't written anything, but uh, maybe maybe Aaron could advise us. And because uh, right now we have uh, a recorded minute meeting, we have minutes, but the commission hasn't taken any action. Uh, and there's a severe erosion problem, which shouldn't be. Um, uh, so I'm asking if it's appropriate for us to quickly put together a motion to capsulize what we're asking them to do and work with Aaron in between now and the next meeting so that they come back uh, and tell us, you know, how they acted under that motion. So, okay. Aaron, um, I, so it seems, need, let me just, oh, go ahead, Alex, sorry. We need some help, Aaron, uh, and, and chair. I don't have anything to propose. So, as I understand it, essentially the, um, what we're looking at, and Aaron, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, we can make suggestions right now, but the only action that we can take is if there's an overflow that uh, gets these, this polluted water into the resource. Is that correct, Aaron? So in terms of like taking um, enforcement action, um, there would need to be resource area alteration. And so I would encourage you to wait on that um i wasn't suggesting that yeah i don't i don't think that there i mean you you guys can make a motion if you wish to um my recommendation would be that you advise the applicant that um by say the middle of next week that erosion measures erosion protection measures be installed on the site and that i be contacted once those measures are installed so i can go out and take photos and verify that those measures have been installed prior to our next meeting that way at your next meeting you're looking at what those measures are um i think that might be one way to to address this um and that if i go out there and i look at the site and inspect these controls and they're not adequate at that point I would tell them they're not adequate and you need more um so uh, that's kind of I think setting a deadline for when you expect to have the the adjustments made would be a, a good suggestion for how to kind of um set a set a requirement for when your expectation for when these will be adjusted will be Great advice, Aaron. Thank you. Um, perhaps if we did uh, put that into the, uh, we'll, we'll make, we can make the the request and then put that into the motion. Does that make any sense? Um, you any could sense? you could make a motion something to the effect of um, <clears throat> that prior to or by um, close of business on Wednesday, July seventeenth, you'd like to have. Um, uh, erosion and stabilization measures measures installed at the site and um uh, ha uh set up have the um, staff set up a site inspection um subsequent to that to um, verify whether they're adequate okay 
I don't have my hand up, but, <laughs> but Jason was first, but I was just going to ask Erin if she could quickly draft something like she just suggested for us. I think that's a good idea. Erin? Yes, you mean uh, on a slide? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Erin. Jason? Yeah, sorry, but prior to us doing that and making that motion, um, they have a SWIP. The SWIP requires them to do things. They're required for construction general permit compliance to be doing these things. To me, without having been on the site walk, this project does not look like it's in compliance with the permit or with their SWIP. So we need to keep that in mind as well. So uh, just bear in mind that if we're giving them X amount of days, that that does not necessarily jive with what is required in the permit for them to uh, identify BMP deficiencies and address them and to address erosion on site. So I think that before we make a motion, we ought to just defer overall to the construction general permit and to their SWIP compliance that is already required. Um, I don't know who necessarily is enforcing SWIP compliance on this project, but I want us to be sure that we are not, um, I guess for lack of a better term, interfering or in some way altering the, the requirements that are in the SWIP and the construction general permit. If I That's could good. comment on that, I'd like to really quickly. Um, I don't think anyone is tracking compliance on the SWIP. As a matter of fact, I don't think the SWIP reports have been accurate. I was out on the site on May 30th after a pretty major storm. I documented multiple SWIP violations in photos. I specifically told the contractor on site that day, the supervising contractor, that I wanted to see the SWIP report from that event sent to me. It was sent to me today and the SWIP report stated everything was in good shape and no corrections were needed. So this is a situation of, I, I do not trust the SWIP reporting on this site. I, I, I'll be completely honest with you. It's, it's, um, it's, it's Aaron, sorry, if I can interrupt you, I, I guess I was dancing around that a little bit. Uh, the SWIP report appeared to have come from the contractor. I don't know if the person, I didn't see a list of that person's, what makes that person a um, responsible entity for, you know, I don't know what training they have. I don't know what certifications, if any, they have uh, or experience they have in reviewing a SWIP or implementing a SWIP, but it appears that, you know, like you said, no one is actually doing that. Um, and so a question I was going to ask kind of procedurally is, are we able to require a third party SWIP inspection company to come in? Are we able to require the contractor to have that? Because ultimately the university is responsible for compliance, not the contractor, but having the contractor prepare the SWIP report is a little bit of the fox guarding the hen house, in my opinion. Not a little bit, it is. Agreed. Um, Jason, uh, when are we gonna see that SWIP report? Me, meaning Jason Vendetti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Gotcha. That's like in the last meeting. Uh, we I hear your comments, Jason. That's uh, we. It's a tricky uh, hierarchy in regard to how we manage project on this campus, and your comment is heated. Uh, this is a construction manager that we have uh, actually have done multiple projects on campus, and he, you know the more and more I hear your comments, I have uh, four or five exclamation points written down here of things to follow up with tomorrow. So I, we hear your comments. Um, we do indeed own this as the phrase I like to use. This is owned in the project. They own the SWIP. They own the measures. They own erosion control. They own sediment control. They own all of these measures as part of their contract. So the enforcement process of that is something that we've discussed already internally in regard to how we manage this going forward. 
uh, didn't want to muddy the waters using the pun for uh -huh. this conversation um because it's, it's something that we have discussed uh so we hear your comments and uh we do not mind at all per david's comments to formalize this more with aaron in regard to what measures are there what measures were done already what measures are going forward and again the certain parts of things that you guys might even approve that we don't approve we don't want them using our infiltration basins as part of their swip that's not part of their swip so there's things even that we might enforce that we are aware of so Comment heated. Um, I, I can't tell you what to do in regard to third party, not third party, but uh, we concur with what you're saying. All right. So, so Jason, do you, uh, so you're, are you saying that you don't have control over the SWIP, so therefore uh, you can't tell us when, when we're going to get it? No, we can, we have a contract with this construction manager and we have alerted them to the fact that they own a SWIP that has protection measures, both erosion control, sediment control, et cetera, that we did not feel as though per the site visit on Monday that they were uh, appropriately using and uh, what we, and again, I use the phrase, and it's when you get a construction management of the world, we own this as in, it's not like they're coming back for an extra um you know this this is we already own this so it's not even like we're looking for extra money or extra efforts it's like it's efforts but it's not fee based effort no, so jason, no jason i'm sorry to cut you off here when 7 17 is probably a good estimate of when jason. we can get some stuff done yes i if the seventh wednesday the comment that aaron had on 7 17 yeah. some of those measures have already been put in place we'll continue daily interaction with that construction manager to further that and provide updates probably daily to aaron in regard to what measures have been done so, so you said on the seventeenth we should be able to see that SWIP? Uh no, you I'm sorry, Aaron already has the SWIP. Oh really? I I thought yes. we were waiting for that. Okay. Or that it just got in today. Is that what what happened? Aaron? Aaron, you're muted. Yep. Sorry. I received the SWIP inspections today. Oh. What I was what I was saying is that the SWIP inspection from the last date that I was, well, not the last date, but one of the dates I was out there, which was 530, when I documented SWIP violations occurring on site and I told the contractor they needed to be documented in the SWIP report and that I wanted a copy of the SWIP report sent to me. I never received that. I received it today. This is from 530. I see. Okay. In that report, it stated there were no problems on site and no corrections were needed. So... And, th and those are pictures where there were, the the water was, I mean, the pictures are in your inspection report, so you can see them from 530. They're in your packet. Um, but the what I'm saying is the, the SWIP inspection was erroneous. It was not accurate. I don't think that they even either went out on site or were accurately, in any way, accurately um, representing the site conditions because the site conditions were a SWIP violation that day, and they were stated as being completely fine and no corrections were needed. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Jason and then Laura. Sorry, I uh, thought I learned my hand. <laughs> but uh, I do just want to reiterate that regardless of what is in the contract, the university owns the project and the university is responsible for compliance, Yeah, not the contractors. So, so Thank you, Laura. So I, I think um, I think we reiterated this point, but I, I I like Aaron's suggestion of outlining the changes that we expect to have seen, the changes we can confirm visually on the seventeenth. Um, I don't think we need to be, I mean, even discussing the contractor. I think it's all on UMass. Everyone has different contracts with different damages provisions. I mean. You know, I think it's just on us to deal directly with UMass. So contractor could be great. Contractor could be terrible. That's why contracts are in place for enforcement. Um, and if there's, you know, if the contractor is not doing what UMass wants them to do, there's probably damages within that contract. But I think we just deal with facts. Here are the things we need to have in place. Aaron will go out and confirm. Um, and I think, you know, uh, that that's, that's the, my main comment. And I... I just want to be respectful of others who might have hearings tonight, Andre. I got you. Thank you. All right. One last comment there from uh, David. I see your uh, hands up. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to, I just wanted to uh, 
let you all, we hear you loud and clear. Statements like the project doesn't appear to comply with SWIP. Um, we don't think we're, we're um, actually enforcing it and the reports we get are inconsistent with what the things, it, it couldn't be any clearer to us. It's quite frankly why I don't wanna wait two weeks. We need to uh, we need to understand the feedback we got tonight. That will happen over the next day or two, and then we'll get in the get in the business of correcting the issues um, as quickly as possible. Again, the reason for the um, being able to work directly with Aaron is you know everyone has an opinion on what things I, I want to get to consensus of what we all think will work, so we can get onto the business of finding the solution to the problem. But right now we have an immediate issue that. I just want to deal with. That sounds great. Thank you, David. And so, yeah, uh, deal uh, between uh, now and the next uh, meeting, uh, you go ahead and uh, talk to uh, Aaron directly. Um, and with that now, uh, I, we're looking for a motion. Can we just take a minute to read it? Yeah, absolutely. Seven days from now. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I raise my hand. You don't have to. You can ask the question now. <laughs> uh, Jason, I really appreciate. Uh, this is Jason Dorning. I really appreciate your comment to make sure that we don't make a motion that undermines their existing requirements. And so I'm interested in your opinion about whether or not what's being proposed here as a motion um, uh, is a concern to you with that regard. Can I just say something here in between? Yeah. Go ahead, Andre. Uh, um, if we put some uh, wording in here, uh, um, stating that none of that uh, not, none of what we're uh, requesting uh, should be in contravention uh, to the uh, state conditions or the SWIP, right? Is that where we're going with that? Yeah, um, that's a point that Jason Dorney raised that we not undermine the existing requirements or mm -hmm. even imply, you know, by setting a deadline that somehow they they don't need to comply immediately. Um, so I just want to be careful and and being respectful to what Jason Dorney pointed out after I first suggested the motion. That's all. I, I think, yeah. Andre, can I? Just chime. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say something similar. Jason Dorney, thank you for pointing that out. I do know that the SWIFT often requires um, inspections after a certain rainfall amount and um, any immediate remediation. So um, I want to avoid a situation where the contractor thinks that they could wait until 717 to make to complete this work. I was just looking at the rain projected rainfall, which I know UMass is also looking at. Um, and that would be a concern if they are not acting as soon as tomorrow to make these repairs and changes. Um, that's great. So I, I think my only comment is um, because we don't know, I, I see them as very as Perhaps I'm not looking at this correctly, but almost as two very distinct issues. So whatever UMass has in their contract with their contractor is kind of not necessarily our concern. I think we need to spell out what we, um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think we need to spell out what we require, um, irrespective of what, you know, I mean, UMass could go to the contractor tomorrow and say, we want all these things done by Friday. Um, that's kind of their prerogative, not necessarily our business. I think we just need to get comfortable with a date where we expect to see changes. So that, that's my thinking. 
Great, thanks. And Jason, you had another, you, you were the last, you were the one who. Yep, I, you know, I think that the seven day time frame is just, uh, um, from what I recall, you have seven days to make these repairs, but that seven days after they're identified, which would have been last week, uh, you know, the bottom line is I don't personally, I don't think we ought to be putting a time frame in our motion. I don't think we need to necessarily make a motion. And if we're going to make a motion that they do something, I think it should be like within 48 hours, not seven days. Um, that's my personal opinion. I think they need to comply with their SWIFT. They need to comply with the construction general permit. Um, as of yet, it appears that they haven't had a discharge into the resource area. So from our jurisdiction, I just don't know, Aaron, how that works. But if they didn't have a discharge into the resource area, I don't know where we stand. And I don't think we ought to be putting time frames on them to repair BMPs or install new BMPs when that's already very clearly outlined should be very clearly outlined in their SWIP and in the construction general permit. And then, so I, I, I don't think that we should be putting ourselves in that position right now, if there hasn't been an impact to the resource area. Okay. Um, So your suggestion, Jason, is then that we uh, just go ahead with the regu with the uh, motion that we had uh, written down earlier, and that we just require or request that they um, that uh, within the next x amount of time, or without putting a time frame on it, that uh, that they. My yeah, my from from not being on the the site visit and from looking at the pictures that are in our packets, if we get more rain, if we get half an inch of rain or we get another inch of rain before they dip out that little basin that's like already holding water, we've there's pictures of clearly silt fence has been blown over. I think silt fence at the bottom of a slope of that steepness and length is wholly inadequate. Um, no erosion controls is wholly inadequate. And if another rain comes and the site's in the condition that it's in in those photos, there probably will be a discharge into the resource area or at least off-site threatening the resource area. And it's my opinion that if there is a discharge into the resource area, there will have to be a an enforcement action taken immediately. And so I think that we should as opposed to saying you need to fix this in seven days. We just, we we don't make any kind of statement like that. They understand, it seems they understand that they know what they need to do. And, yep. they've got, you know, they said they hear us. So, you know, it's my opinion that if there is impacts to the resource area, there should be an immediate enforcement. Yeah. And, and frankly, yeah, you're, you're, I, I see where you're saying, and they should, fix it before before we get any new rains and yeah uh, that's not something we can define yes yeah. gotcha that's my opinion thank you well uh jason and david there you there you have it um no need to comment there Al alex yeah um my phone says the next rain is saturday's 70 percent chance anyways aaron when we were on site and we walked down the path, the, the the paved pathway at the bottom of the slope. There was a retention pond on the downhill side of that walkway that uh, had sediment in it. Was that in the resource area? Was that within the hundred foot buffer? Um, I believe it was just outside the hundred foot buffer, but close to the edge of it. I was there today. It's dry, by the way. I'm sorry, what did you say, Chair? Uh, it was dry today. I uh, Just uh, an, a comment on it. I was there uh, this evening. The um, That's a large retention pond. Yeah, it, it was on the left as you're going down the hill? No, as you're... 
um, there's a there's a paved walkway at the bottom of the slope that runs north and south. Yeah, I think Andre is saying if you're walking down the paved walkway, it's on your left. Is that what you were saying, Andre? That's what I was saying. Okay. Yeah, I think we're talking about the same pond. Yeah, it was dry. You're walking from the parking lot. He he was the... walking from the the walkway, Alex, the paved walkway. That was sort of the second part of our site visit when we were standing on that paved walkway. Yeah. So he was going from the from the paved walkway where it comes off of Orchard Hill Road towards Eastman Lane, and it's on your left if you're going in that direction. If you're walking towards the parking lot. If you're walking, no, I, no. I was walking north. If you're walking north, it's on the uh, it's in the west side. Okay, what I'm talking about is on the east side. Oh, I'm not sure where that is. I didn't I, I didn't walk all the way down to the uh, bottom parking lot. Um, no, it's no, you don't have to go that far. Anyways, yeah. the pond that we looked at had sediment in it, and it was explained why at the time. And I just wanted to know if it was in a resource, if that was within the 100 foot buffer. Um, and and I see what we're trying to do is be proactive to prevent a um, material going into the resource area. So I'm I'm um, this is a, a delicate thing we're talking about and so I'm um yeah no that's not it that's not it that's not the one you're talking about no no it the oh, you're talking about you're talking about the one that's um that's the walkway the, actual... the walkway is outside that fence yeah you're talking about the permanent store not the construction phase BMP but this detention basin that has the silty water in it that's beyond the erosion controls yeah yeah that's that is within the buffer zone yeah okay so that has sediment in it so the sediment that's moving is already in the yeah it's, it's i remember that site and it's just down the path a little bit from there mm -hmm. yeah it's on the it's on the wrong side of the erosion controls where the silt is that's for sure that's right uh -huh. that's inside the 100 buck buffer we already have material moving from the, the construction site into the resource area. So it's already happened, Jason. Okay, okay. And um, I would rather not wait for more of it to go into the resource area. If there's something we can do that's the right thing to do that's proactive, um, um, I'd be comfortable with that. But I, 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 I know this is a delicate walk. Thanks, Alex. Let's, uh, Aaron, what do you think of that? So uh, it feels like we're at a bit of an impasse. Um, and I think this is my thought. We have a hearing that's, that was supposed to open at 735. We spent over an hour on this hearing. I understand this is a, you know, it's it's an, it's an a concern. I 100% agree with you. Um, I think they, the, the university is aware that if there is a an, a breach where um, there is a resource area alteration that there's going to be enforcement action. They're aware of that. And I think, as they've said multiple times, they hear us loud and clear. They're working with the contractor to come up with solutions. They have a SWIP that they're supposed to be complying with. Um, I am inclined to agree with Jason that, you know, getting involved with our directive versus the SWIP directive, like, let's not muddy the waters. Let's continue the hearing. I'll work with them. They've agreed to work with me and communicate with me on what's going on. And we'll um, do our best to make sure that nothing happens um, to the resource areas and that they take the action that needs to be taken to prevent that from happening. But um, I think at this point we're going in circles and that we should probably move on and um, do what we can in the next two weeks to update you. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I think at this point, we, what I'm, what I'd like to see is a motion, Alex, uh, your final thoughts. Yeah. I'm ready to move towards a motion, but I, I just want to remind you, Mass, that Erin is great to work with, but she is not the commission. So um, we reserve our opportunity to uh, act on our own. And um, we always listen to what Aaron has to say, but she is not us. So please keep that in mind. And if you've already got material moving into the resource area, um, according to Jason, then an enforcement action is ripe. 
Thanks, Alex. So now we're looking for a uh, motion to continue the public hearing for DEP number 0890738, UMass 150. I'll make that motion, Andre. Uh, so uh, moving to continue the public hearing for DEP number 0890738, UMass 152 Orchard Hill Drive, NOI to 724, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Okay, that's Laura with a motion and Alex uh, with a second. Uh, Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. Jason? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. Did I skip somebody? I did not. All right, well, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, to all of you from uh, from the UMass uh, from UMass SWCA etc., and uh, we'll look we're looking forward to seeing the improvements that uh, we've talked about, and uh, hopefully uh, see where we can take this uh, in two weeks. All right. Very good. Thank you. Good night. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. And with that. We move uh, into the uh, second uh, hearing. Um, I guess I'll be reading, uh, Aaron, I'll be reading the, uh, okay. Um, uh, the Zengineer on behalf of uh, Amherst College, um, uh, and today is uh, July 10th, 2024. Um, this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31, wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. Um, we've got uh, uh, this notice of intent that Zen engineer on behalf of Amherst College for building additions, pavement rehabilitation, stormwater improvement, resource area restoration, and energy decarbonization at 151 and 0 College Street. Um, there's a uh, legal ad published, uh, butters are notified, and uh, there was a site visit uh, on 7 8. Um, now staff comments, uh, Aaron. Yes, so um, we we had a great site walk. Um, I think that there, um, just, I'll just, my comments went out today and I realized that you guys haven't had a chance to look at them. Um, you oh, you did, okay. Um, so some of you might've, but um, I think they're really, you know, I just wanna say Amherst College has done a great job to meet with me in advance of this filing multiple times, take my comments into consideration. Um, the I think that the remaining things are sort of dotting I's and crossing T's at this point um, relative to making sure that the operation and maintenance plan contains all the stormwater structures on the site and that the um, the we have a, a sort of a, a template operation and maintenance plan um, log that I would like for them to use for the stormwater structures so that um, they have a, a very clear operation and maintenance um, document for their um, facility staff to be doing the maintenance once the facilities are constructed. Um, there are a couple minor questions. Um, uh, you know, there was some suggestions about pervious pavement. Um, I know um, uh, Darren did respond to some of my comments um, after the close of business today. So he, I'm sure, will want to comment on a couple of those comments. So I'll, I'll reserve the rest of my time. You guys could, you know, have a look at my memo and see, but I think that we're, it's very close. And I think there's just a couple minor things that we need to just iron out, resolve, get answers to, but um, that the plan is, is very close to being at the point of closing the hearing and getting approved. All right. Um, thank you. So I think with that, we'll uh, we'll bring in um, who who was it? You said Darren. Yep, Darren Gray, and um, I and think it's Chris. Chris. I, I think it's Chris. Yeah. I'm both here. Yep. Bring in. I won't Chris. recognize Chris. He said he was going to get a haircut. <laughs> okay, we'll have to see now. Here he is. 
Go ahead, Chris. Welcome, uh, welcome, and thanks for uh, joining us. Or Darren. Well, yeah. Well, thanks for having me. And Alex, this this is kind of what I look like now. <laughs> I did get a haircut. I'm a man of my word. Uh, and I even have a headshot that proves it. So, <laughs> but I'll yeah. let Darren introduce the project. You had to be there to understand. Uh, Andre, I think you should explain that we're having Zoom difficulties that will not enable them to have full features. Yeah. Hi, uh, Andre's Darren muted. Thanks, uh, there, uh, Darren um, and Chris. I'm not sure if you can see that on the uh, middle of your screen. Usually, there's a share screen um, uh, icon with uh, that's in green. Um, if you can't see it, it's because we've been having some uh, some issues with uh, Zoom. Are you able you to see it? it, Darren? Oh, oh that's great. Great. Yeah, he could see it. Yeah, I'll make sure I got That's the right. Weird. All right. Okay. Maybe All right. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, first of all, everyone, thank you for your time. I know it's a little bit late here, so thanks, Aaron, for the time tonight and all your time leading up to today. And thank you to all the commission members for you know, your time, attention, and collaboration on this project. Um, we are here today to talk about our Energy Center with Geo Borefield as part of our Climate Action Plan, which is a campus-wide initiative we have ongoing, and also um, a building renovation in our Seymour building, which is the green building in the background here. And uh, we're also coming forward proactively with the proposal for mitigation measures. We do have uh, impacts in buffer zones as part of the main projects, so we wanted to come forward with a well-thought-out um, kind of comprehensive mitigation plan as well. Um, well, that just kind of restates what I just said. So I'll go on to our team. So for Amherst College, I'm here. I'm a professional engineer, civil engineer, uh, capital project manager. Uh, Chris? Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Chris Tate. I am also a professional civil engineer and capital project manager here at Amherst College. And you know, as, as we we're getting these slides together, I couldn't help but just mention we have a ton of talented people here at the campus who are working hard on this project, from our operations folks, to other people in our department, and, and you know, pretty much throughout the campus here. Um, and so for the Climate Action Plan projects, oh, I see a hand up, I think. You're, you're muted. Darren, we're having a hard time seeing that, uh, the, the uh, full page. It looks like you got it uh, zoomed in, so it doesn't fit in what we can see. Okay, let me. I'm gonna try to share differently here. Hold on. Let me share the. Bear with me for a second here. Yeah. Is that looking better? It looks better, but it's not centered on your page, so we can't see what's on the left uh, side of your page. I'm seeing all of it. Yeah, I am seeing, seeing all of it as well. <laughs> you know what it was? I, okay, here we go. Excuse <laughs> me. I, um, I had uh, pinched it uh, closed earlier. Never mind. Thank you. No worries. Thanks for speaking up. Um, so the Climate Action Plan Project, the design team, it's funny, we've had this confluence of... Um, vacations amongst our design teams and we were able to get on the agenda tonight we wanted to make sure we you know kept our, our schedule moving so Chris and I are representing the project entirely tonight but we're both as we mentioned professional engineers uh, we've both been through many you know permitting hearings in the past so but our design team for climate action plan is Salas O'Brien and Haley and Aldrich and Salas O'Brien they're really like an industry leader um, for this type of project uh, the Seymour Cold Prep Renovations, that's uh, Berkshire Design, as well as CNH Consultants, two of our local firms. And then for the mitigation design, resource area enhancements, uh, and also helped out with the NOI permitting application materials, the engineer, Bucky Sparkle, who I think is a friend of the commission, or at least well-known by the commission, I should probably say. And SWCA did the um, wetlands delineation and the uh, ANRAD process uh, some months ago. And so, as Chris and I were talking here leading up to tonight, it occurred to us, you know, it's, this has been, tonight's been a year in the making for us. Um, you know, we worked, got our wetlands delineation done. 
and in place, got the ANRAD done. And throughout that, we've um, had several meetings with the town. So with Aaron, we had one, uh, you know, we had permitting conversation approaches during the ANRAD process when all of this was coming together. And it became clear to us that, uh, as Aaron told us, the DEP doesn't want to see more than one file number on a parcel. Since we had multiple projects on one parcel, uh, she advised that these all be brought together under one application. Um, so as part of our permitting approach here, um, we've had pre-submittal meetings before submitting, and um, the, the, it was also just um, it made very clear, you know, the, the town's concerns with the Fearing Brook and the associated resource areas. We had a, a meeting dedicated to that topic as well that included Dave Zomack and Aaron, um, leadership from the campus, myself, Chris, and then, of course, we had our site walk the other day. And, uh, you know, after we had the ANRAD process to really lock in those wetlands, had some pre-submittal meetings, it became very clear what we required. Uh, we, we had not just one meeting with our designers, we had several meetings with our designers, and, you know, had them alter their designs to, um, you know, decrease impacts and buffer zones and uh, retain some existing infrastructure and on and on. But we suffice to say that we've worked very hard to get things to a, as good of a position as we can to come before the board tonight. And so with that, let me get into existing conditions. Um, so starting off with something of a locust map here. Um, in this corner, this is really the area of the projects. Um, but it does come over to the second parcel that Amherst College owns. And between these two parcels, it's roughly 97 acres. Uh, the large parcel, the Fearing Brook, comes along here in parallel to Route 9, northerly on the screen. Um, Seymour Building, Central Plants. And I we came before the commission, I think it was either earlier this year or late last year, regarding a wildlife sanctuary maintenance project. And that partially exists on this parcel, as well as plenty of resource areas. Um, we're going to talk a lot about you know, drainage outfalls today and what we're doing for drainage design. So this is an important locus in that you can see any drainage outfalls from this property really come onto the Amherst College property. The next abutter is a thousand feet away, which is the power lines. Looks like a power easement through here. Um, so really quite some distance and a lot of resource areas here to help us manage our water. But we are meeting all of our stormwater management standards in our project designs. Um, zooming into the actual site. North will be on the left of your screen where you see College Street. And I'm just going to pretty much, you know, get everyone acclimated with, with where we are here. So the Seymour building where we have the renovation project in the north part of the building is here. Uh, the central energy plant which provides, you know, heat, power, steam to our campus. there, kind of central on the screen. Um, this is our east lot, which we'll be talking about. And um, as far as drainage discharges go, the Fearing Brook comes through this the yellow highlighting as the e, the town easements through our parcel. The culvert comes under the parking lot. There's a 54 inch culvert that daylights here onto our neighbor's property. Um, and then it goes down the Fearing Brook as we looked at in the Locust. And just to the right or south of that, Amherst College, there's a 12 inch pipe that comes down from really up near Valentine. Dining Commons is where it starts, where it collects stormwater runoff from our campus. And, you know, this is our buildings, our grass areas, our walkways. It's not high pollutant loading, but it does discharge untreated water directly into the Fearing Brook, which is something we're aiming to correct with our mitigation measures. Here is the pond on site. Um, out of this pond, there's an 18 inch discharge pipe on this side here, which leads to the bank on that side of the screen. And then and <clears throat> we also have a 12 inch pipe discharging here from areas around the central energy plant. Again, these are pretty much untreated flows coming from here currently. And so, going on to the slide, this shows our, our work stress redevelopment projects here. Um, now, again, I want to stress that the, the, the work at the Seymour building and the central energy plant, these are the, the primary project. This is why we're here. Um, these are colored in yellow on the text callouts and the mitigation measures are in orange. And so again, we're gonna be renovating this north part of the Seymour shed. We're putting a small concrete pad in the back, a small pad here for a compactor and a small building addition for a second loading dock on the building here, an accurate loading dock. Then the um, central energy plant, we'll have an addition there, which Chris will get into much more detail on in a minute. And of course, adjusting the, the ring road for access, new detention systems and some temporary measures for construction. Um, let's see if there's anything else I need to put, talk about on this one. 
Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris and he's going to get into more detail on the Climate Action Plan project. Thanks, Darren. So the crux of Amherst College's Climate Action Program, um, this is something that started in 2019, I believe, and um, we broke ground last year, uh, but we're really, we're targeting uh, transitioning from our existing steam infrastructure to a new low temperature hot water infrastructure um, where we can use heat pumps and electricity and of course renewable electricity to heat this, this uh, low temperature hot water. Um, so we were targeting what we're calling our core campus. So uh, our overall campus, we have 82 buildings, two and a half million square feet. Um, but we have about 1.6 million square feet on our district steam system. And that's all fed out of the central energy plant um, adjacent to East Lot that we were just looking at. Uh, we also have a central chiller plant in that same building. Uh, as you can see, about 530,000 square feet comes from that chiller plant. And then there are three other steam absorption chillers in different buildings on campus uh, where we get more chilled water. And the chilled water is how we do air conditioning, cooling. Um, yeah, next slide, Darren. This isn't quite zoomed in on my screen. I don't know if, if there's anything we can do about that. Um, but this color coding kind of shows the process. So our goal is to be done with, with this plan, essentially, by 2030. That's kind of when we turn our steam off and we're solely reliant on um, the low temperature hot water infrastructure that we're putting in and the heat pumps that make that low temperature hot water. So uh, we actually completed phase one of this project last year last summer, uh, and that's everything in green, which was which was quite a bit. So that is um, digging trenches and putting in pipe, connecting to the green buildings, uh, renovating in mechanical rooms to switch from steam to low temperature hot water. Uh, and then we're into phase two this year, which is half of the blue loop, um, pretty much starting from where the the green ends and uh, and curving around the the front side of College Row, as we would say, uh, parallel to South Pleasant Street, and getting about to Frost Library across Quadrangle Drive. Um, so that's what we're hoping to accomplish uh, this summer, and then next summer, Phase Three will be completing that blue, and then at that point, we'll have kind of a, a entire loop of our campus. And then we uh, spur off of that loop with the red and the magenta and do all of that. And eventually by the time we get to 2030, we can turn the steam off in the central energy plant completely. Uh, and then we're just making low temperature hot water at that point. Um, next slide, please. So this might be a convoluted slide, I don't know, but I like to include it because it's colorful and uh, it kind of shows why we're doing what we're doing. So um, the heat pump technology allows us to do a lot of uh, great things um, by having our chiller, our cooling plant and our heating plant in the same place, we can actually use our heat pumps to move energy from one to the other. So we can take heat out of the chilled water system and put it into the hot water system, thereby making the chilled water colder, the hot water hotter. And that's like, free energy. It's, uh, it's great. All we have to do is pay to move, move energy from one place to another, but we get like seven times more efficiency out of it. So that is amazing. Um, the next best thing we can do is uh, a geothermal exchange with these heat pumps. So we have uh, a bore field under the parking lot, which we'll look at in a second. Um, and one of the key things about this bore field is we want it to be balanced on an annual basis. So we want the same amount of uh, heat that we draw out of, the, out of the earth in the winter to be the same amount of heat that we put back into the earth during the summer for cooling. So our uh, geo bore field is really based on the cooling demands of the campus. Uh, and 
because of the region we live in and also because of we don't you know not all of our buildings are air conditioned um, those cooling loads are less than our heating loads on on campus um, so then it's more efficient for us to also have some air source heat pumps uh, and that is the abbreviation ashp on this chart um, so we we do supplement some of our heating with air source heat pumps, which are getting more and more efficient and can operate um, down to colder temperatures and get us warmer water. So uh, there's really great things happening with the air source heat pumps. And then at the very margins, um, one reason is for resiliency, um, because when the electricity goes out, we need to be able to still heat our campus, but also just for peak design days, we do have some conventional heating uh, with natural gas remaining. Uh, Chris. Uh, Aaron, you have your hand raised? I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just, um, uh, uh, I guess, a little worried about the content of the presentation because it's not necessarily geared towards sort of the proposed work and the project relative to wetlands. I'm not saying it's not all important. I'm just contextually it's kind of far afield from the conservation commission's um role of reviewing the project so I, I just don't know how long of a presentation it's going to be relative to um that and so i just was okay. pointing that out because i'm getting a little lost in it all just okay. as like it's not my i'm like what is i don't i just don't understand its relevancy to the wetlands protection side of things although no, i, I understand relative to the overall project of what you're doing, I 100% support it. Okay, so so climate, good, decarbonation, good. And that's, you know, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so to that effect, that's kind of why we're focused in the areas we're focused in on site. So I think if we go to the next slide, we can kind of get back to what we're here to talk about, um, which, yeah, is a little zoomed in. So, uh, we're putting all of our fancy heat pumps in this addition to the south of our central energy plant. And uh, this, this location is very important to us because it's adjacent to our chiller plant. So all of these heat pumps that I'm talking about kind of need, they really wanna be in the same place to operate the most efficiently. Um, so that's kind of why the addition uh, was cited where it was cited um, and that you'll see some some green lines there so we have our our wetland resource right next to seymour shed we have the 50 foot no work zone and the 100 foot buffer zone so you can see our uh energy center addition just grazes that 100 foot buffer zone um, we have the ring road that kind of pushes out as darren explained in into the 100 foot um, but not past the 50 foot and then we have um some stormwater chamber or sorry i guess uh stormwater detention chambers that are still outside of the 50 foot no work zone um we're picking up well i guess we're replacing existing catch basins in this area that essentially just discharge right to the wetland kind of what maybe used to be a swale but is now a wetland um so we're replacing those catch basins as you can see with the highlighted structures um, and roof water from the addition is also going into that drainage system. It all passes through a proprietary stormwater treatment chamber uh, into the detention system where we mitigate peak flows. And then it comes out of that system and ties into the existing system, the existing uh, outfall into the wetland area. And then we uh, we also pick up with some area drains and catch basins and and head to the north to the existing uh, stormwater pond up there. Um, so there is some grading associated in previous areas to uh, get these detention chambers, keep them underground. Um, but there's no new impervious or new uh, structures of any kind within the 50 foot area um you know you will see very clearly that we have existing parking and existing building even in that 50 foot no work zone uh because i think the 
the wetlands have been creeping up on us over the last 20 years when when these last uh, stormwater controls were put in. Um, also, just to to tie it all together, we're looking at a, uh, a temp gravel parking area that would stay outside of the 100 foot buffer zone and a temporary trailer, which would sit on the grass inside the 100 foot buffer zone, but wouldn't uh, disturb the ground. Um, yeah. They're actually proposing fabric topped by stone underneath the fat, underneath the trailer, but still no disturbance. And it's temporary. So the fabric allows them to just pull up all the stone after the fact. Right, so we'll restore that area after uh, construction's complete. And then if we go to the next slide, that's further to the north. And this is- Aaron, did you have another comment? I just wanted to make one uh, one thing clear, which is the swale that um, uh, Chris referenced down here. This is actually a constructed stormwater structure. Um, it was constructed uh, by an engineering company. And it's the reason that it's reverted to wetland is because of lack of maintenance, but it was actually a permitted constructed stormwater structure. So my understanding is that part of this project is to um, clean that clean that structure, um, return it to its original design specifications so that it will function into the future as uh, the, the stormwater swale that it was designed to be. Right. Just and didn't we'll want get that in, to get lost. Right. We'll get into those mitigation measures, um, I think, a little bit later in the presentation. But um, just for the, the actual addition uh, to the central energy plant, uh, we have a, a drainage, a stormwater management system that, you know, hits all 10 standards um, by discharging to, you know, through an existing point source. Uh, hey, and then, hey, Chris, uh, if you can uh, limit the rest of your time to, let's say, five minutes, do you think that's uh, fair for you to be able to do that? For my time, certainly. Yeah. I just I just want to go a little bit north All right, thank on you. the next slide here and just look at the geo bore right. field. Um, utility runs here to bring us up to the bore field. This is the, go ahead, Chris. So we're looking at 135 uh, bores and these are, these are 850 feet deep. Uh, they do not interface at all with groundwater. So they, there's uh, liquid in them that circulates uh, through the bores and back to the energy center, but they're all completely grouted in. And the only thing they're doing is transferring their heat between the ground and the water inside them. So uh, again, as I was saying with my, with my colorful picture that um, we don't put in more heat in a year than we take out. We essentially use the earth as a, as a giant thermal battery in that way. So we're not heating the ground up or cooling the ground up off um, if you look at it on an annual basis. And uh, so some of this work, some of these bores are, you know, close to the uh, Fearing Brook Bank resource. Um, because our existing pavement is very close to that resource as well. And I think that's it. Okay, and I guess something else we just add is we have had two test boards done out here. Um, so we could better understand what that operation would be like. So we've had to get the permit through the Board of Health for that. We're aware of that process. Um, and before any of this happens, we would of course do the same for this multitude of bores. Um, but next, when I go into the ENS plan, and Chris, you can take it from there and talk about what our test bores taught us. Oh, yeah. So we we used a, a drilling contractor to do our two test bores, and we were not happy with the process. Um, Aaron came out and witnessed some of that as well, and we understand how sensitive um, the resource areas are. So we actually got back with our engineers at Salis O'Brien. Um, and they do a lot of this work nationally, and they recommended a different method of drilling um, that doesn't allow any groundwater encountered uh, during the drilling operations to kind of just spurt out of the hole. Um, instead, it's all kind of uh, circulated through hoses, and they can, it's called mud rotary, which isn't the best 
cleanest sounding name, but it's a cleaner process that um, kind of keeps the mud keeps mud in the hose and it goes to a central processing plant or like a skid um, and through centrifugal force it kind of gets the water out and the cuttings the the soil is left behind and then the water is circulated back in through the the boring until the grout is put in so in that way it, it really manages water generation on site because we don't want to be generating water from these bores that then uh you know finds its way downhill to the fearing brook and the associated bvw um we understand the importance of sedimentation and erosion control um, and included in this packet uh, there are I think six different ENS plans that kind of demonstrate phasing uh, that'll happen. We're, we're looking at kind of uh, boring on one half of the parking lot first and then getting that buttoned up and then boring on the other half of the parking lot. Um, for a number of reasons. Number one, just to keep you know uh, open areas to a minimum, but then also so we can utilize that parking for the campus because we need it. Um, and I think that's all I have to say, Darren. Sure, I mean, just, I'll just add on with those test bores and going from an air hammer to a mud rotary. And we have been pushing our consultants and our contractors quite hard on this topic. Um, as far as like this, this drilling operation needs to be as clean as it can be, as little water management as there can be. And whatever water we do need to manage needs to be managed very well. Everyone is becoming painfully aware from their interactions with Chris and I about the sensitivity of Fearing Brook, how close these wetland resource areas are, how well they need to be protected. Um, and so they've done a rather detailed phasing uh, of the road systemic controls. And to the point where, you know, our construction manager, DOC, Daniel O'Connell Sons, is it's a major topic in the, uh, the bid process with the different drillers and the site work contractors. And I uh, just wanted to let, just say it again, just so the, the commissions um, understands that we take this as a very, very high priority as does the leadership on our campus. Um, we understand the sensitivity of those areas. So a much simpler project is our um, Seymour building renovation. Um, this building currently houses our operations, like our uh, facilities, our operations, our shops, our warehouse, um, and we're looking to renovate this north part of the building to house what's called cold prep kitchen, where this will support our new student center and dining commons, which is currently under construction. And it will support the electrification of that kitchen. Uh, again, as part of this whole decarbonization, we're looking to electrify the kitchen completely as well. Um, we will be adding 260 square foot at grade loading dock within an existing paved area, a concrete pad for a compactor within an existing paved area and a 10 foot by 15 foot pad sort of in the backyard and the existing gravel storage yard, just for be able to store some materials um, better than they are able to right now. Um, we have utility tie-ins outside of the buffer, uh, including, and we do have some utility tie-ins here within the buffer, but within paved areas down in this area. And this, I'm trying to keep things moving quickly, but, but that's really about it. This is also putting in uh, two refrigerators, one freezer, so we can uh, keep more stock on site, give our uh, dining services more variety of what they can offer, but it also importantly allows us to work, uh, expand what we're able to do with our local farms and providers as well. So we have more storage, and that's an important thing. If you've ever been to, to Valentine Dining Commons, they highlight all of our local partners throughout the dining commons. And that's something to look into even expand upon with the new, um, with the new building. And so the, the projects we just talked about, uh, the Climate Action Plan, which is like an enormous project, decade-long initiative, and even longer, as Chris mentioned. And then this, which is part of the ongoing student centering Diamond Commons, this, this is what we came to the commission for. Um, through our due diligence efforts and conversations uh, with Aaron and Dave Zomack and others, it has become very clear uh, the importance of the Fearing Brook resource. Um, you know, it, it drains a, a lot of downtown, a lot of roads, a lot of um, high pollutant carrying, you know, roadway surfaces. And um, so we have you know, minor buffer zone impacts from these two projects. We have the work that Chris described here, and then otherwise everything is just within pavement, the Seymour Shed. Nonetheless, we wanted to come forward with a really robust and comprehensive mitigation plan. Um, you know, this campus is, as you know, hundreds of years old. 
Uh, we're all very proud of it, as I, as I know the commission is, this campus. But one of the things we have going on here, as I talked about initially, we have some untreated stormwater coming down from campus directly into Fearing Brook. Um, we have you know, apparent erosion in areas. It's very evident when you walk out there. So what we are endeavoring to do as a campus is to mitigate as much as is reasonably possible any impacts coming from this campus onto Fearing Brook. Um, so let me walk through those with you here. And uh, this is a design that this engineer did who would, he's, he's really good at this type of work. So we have this 12 inch pipe coming down from our main campus, discharging directly into the Fearing Brook, right? And so if we have a, a big storm event, I expect this to be a full flowing 12 inch pipe, just kind of gushing out water. So we're intercepting that with a manhole and then directing it to number two, an expanded pond. We have an existing pond there. This design maximizes the space outside of the 50 foot buffer zone. It triples the volume of the pond, allowing much greater peak, peak storm flow of, um, attenuation. And before that, number three, we're putting in a water quality treatment unit, like a hydrodynamic dynamic separator or pr proprietary work techniques unit to make sure we're getting that 95% TSS removal before it even gets to the pond, which will provide even additional measures. Um, further, number four, we are increasing drainage capacity. We're changing grates on existing catch basins. We're adding more catch basins. Uh, under existing conditions, something that we've observed as the Fearing Brook concerns were raised to us, and we spent a lot of time out here, I've hiked around quite a bit myself, is that this is a very steep parking lot. Um, and the water flows down to the bottom of this hill, hits this curb, and it's, a, it's an old curb, it's kind of beat up, and in, in a big storm event, it hops the curb. The water just hops the curb right over the top into Fearing Brook, again, untreated stormwater discharge charge, been going on for years. So we're looking to capture as much of that as we can with additional inlet capacity, and then also we are looking to put in a one foot tall curb through here. So we're looking what will most likely be a granite curb when all is said and done that has one foot exposure at the, at the parking lot, so when water does come down and it hits that, it's going to be hit a rock wall, quite literally. Hit a rock wall. That's also going to help just make sure that this area, this narrow know, 10 foot, 12 foot, 15 foot area between the parking lot and the head wall, help make sure there's nothing else happening here that's going to destabilize or erode that area. Um, another measure we're looking to do is currently the low spot, which I'm sure it made sense when it was built, but the low spot is right at the Fearing Brook. So the water comes down the hill, it goes directly at the Fearing Brook, and will hop the curve in, in high storm events. And so we're looking to change the grades in here and to make the low point over here. So that when the water does get going, if it does back up, if we do have those like deluges and rushes of water, we'll have a break in the curb here that goes to an overflow swale. So that if there is one of these events that backs up the whole system, which is gonna happen, um, it'll overflow directly into the pond, and again, not directly into the Fearing Brook. And I see, Aaron, you have your hand up, so I will stop talking and turn it over to you. I'm just concerned about time, um, and I appreciate- I'm, I'm just about done. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, and of course, Aaron, you pointed out the swale has been silted up. This swale is eroded. They are both from permitted stormwater infrastructure, limited projects to go ahead and maintain those. We've included that, and this is finicky, difficult work. Um, we've included that here also as part of this mitigation effort and then to reestablish with the wetlands plantings throughout here. Um, all the projects proposed tonight meet stormwater management standards. Um, ENS, erosion sediment controls are included throughout. I'm going to go to my last page, which I think everyone will be really happy to see. <laughs> I could speak a little bit to your memo, Aaron, but I just think I should be quiet now. So, <laughs> and I'll open it to questions. Well, thanks, Darren and uh, Chris. Um, we appreciate your uh, your presentation. Um, we do have uh, some questions. I think uh, I think we're gonna take some questions first, though, from the uh, uh, from the public. Um, if if you all can wait, uh, if you have a question that's uh, burning, uh, Jason, I'll uh, go ahead and ask that. No, okay. Uh, any members of the public who uh, would like to comment or who have any questions, please raise your hand. Oh. 
I see no raised hands. So uh, with that said, um, Jason, go ahead. Thank you, Andre. Um, could someone speak to the compactor and the compactor concrete pad? Um, I had initially assumed it was for cardboard or something like that. It says compost on the plan. Um, so can you tell us what is it that you're going to be composting there and what protections are there to prevent any compost or nutrient rich runoff from getting into the resource areas? Well, it's going to be, let me just get to the page for that. So the building of doors, so people can just come directly out here and deposit compost items. I mean, I'm not food services professional, but I would assume this is going to be, you know, wait, this is cold prep. So there's really not going to be meats down here. So this is going to be, you know, pastas, vegetables, breads, that sort of thing, fruits, um, salads. But as far as protections against getting the run runoff, I mean, it's a closed container. Like a dumpster that, that material gets put in and then it compacts it and composts it? Do you, I, I'd like to see some details on what it is. You know, even if it is a closed container, closed containers are never, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's not going to be a lot of food items and things dropped around it. And then how is the finished compost retrieved from it? Where does that finished compost go? Where is it going to be stored? Um at 19 by okay. 12 that's not a very large system is it covered no. is there a roof covering the entire pad there's not a roof covering the entire pad i can answer that for you um as far as how is it retrieved how is the stormwater protected uh, how is the uh receptacle protected from leaching any materials that i can get back to you on that information i'll have to talk to our food services folks on that Okay, thank you. You're muted, Andre. Thanks, Jason and Darren. Uh, Alex, why don't you go ahead with your question? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for your presentation. I am interested in, in the project, and so it was nice to hear about it. It's uh, amazing what Amherst College is doing. Thank you. When I was on the site visit, and I've been on both of them, um, uh, we talked a lot about the water coming off the parking lot and the wall that you were talking about and shunting, changing the grade and shunting that water to the detention pond. Um, and that's terrific, uh, because a lot, Fearing Brook could use a break, <laughs> to say the <laughs> least. Um, I, I I asked the question during the during the um, site visit about permeable surfaces, and I understand there are heavy trucks that need a uh, a, ro a regular road uh, for their deliveries. But I'll ask again: Is it possible to to um, control runoff not only by sending it to the detention pond, but to have permeable surface in the parking lot. Well, I'm going to turn this one over to Chris. He's he's built permeable pavement before, and he, he did research on the state um, BMP design measures as well, guidance today. So I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, and I have another another subject, but I'll come back to it. So I think, unfortunately, Darren, I don't have the same permissions that you do to share my screen or for my camera to work. Um, I don't know if he's just more important than me to Zoom or what's go. Oh, I'm going to be a panelist. I wonder if that's what the problem was that um, maybe maybe when oh, I don't know what just happened there. Um, I might have just. I don't know if I just moved someone. If I did, I apologize. Um, if it was because Andre added them to the room rather than me, and maybe when I added them to the room, they were allowed to share, but when Andre did, it didn't. So maybe that's what the issue was. So 
for future right. solving of it. I'm here. That... <laughs> okay, so I did. Let's see. I'm going to share my screen here. So I did. I did do a little bit of digging in the uh, Mass DEP guidelines uh, for for porous pavement, and and I do agree. I love I love this as a stormwater BMP. Um, I I'm not quite sure it's the right BMP for this site. Um, when you when you look through, well, a couple of things to understand about porous pavement. So. The first thing is it's um it's not just some uh, asphalt with holes in it at the top. There's a very large cross section uh, that needs to be installed to operate. Um, and if you if you follow all of these course minimums and you have a six inch diameter sub drain, which you would want uh, in this site because uh, water isn't draining very well as evidenced by all the wetlands around us, uh, you, you end up two and a half feet deep uh, with an underdrain, and you're really gonna want an underdrain here because it's not gonna infiltrate. Um, so even, even if water goes through this porous pavement, it's still gonna get collected by a pipe and it's still gonna go into the stormwater system. Um, so we're, we're not really, I mean, we are getting the filter course, so we are getting some sand filtration, but you know, I, I think that's that's what we're getting. Um, so they also mentioned that it's most appropriate for pedestrian only areas and for low volume, low speed areas, such as overflow parking areas, residential driveways, alleys, parking stalls. Um, and really this is our back of house. This is uh, heavy duty. There's big tractor trailer trucks that make deliveries to Seymour Shed. And then there's going to be more deliveries for with foodstuffs, um, trash trucks. There's there's a lot of like heavy heavy duty um, activities that happen in this area. Um, and then another consideration is slope. So they really want to do this on um, less steep areas, and um, our parking lot is kind of a little too steep. Uh, as you come down to Fearing Brook, it kind of levels out, but then we're in the uh, the truck route. That's like where all the heavy trucks drive. Um, and you also don't want to be right up against a building with it because the infiltration gets under the slab and uh, isn't isn't great for the buildings. So, you know, so those are some of the uh, you know potential pitfalls for this. So really I was looking and and the best area on site, the most appropriate area on site that isn't either in a steep parking lot, uh, in a heavy duty truck turn area or close to a building are uh, these parking spaces uh, here. And <laughs> unfortunately with that under drain that I was talking about, that's two and a half feet down, it's it's really at the level of this you know, the wetland as it exists now. So it's kind of just going to be surcharged. Um, so it, I love the idea. I love the sentiment, but I, I'm not sure that this is the site for it. I, I did want to show this, uh, this exhibit um, just to get an idea of, so this, these are the existing conditions. This is what the site looks like today. Um, we are going to take pavement out so these green areas are areas where there's pavement now that we're going to remove the pavement. We're also going to put rooftop in. So there's some impervious areas underneath this dry aisle that goes to the building and stuff. Now this is going to be, you know, clean, clean rooftop uh, discharge. So it, it won't be, you know, parking lot discharge. So these are kind of like um, additional areas that we are getting. And then I have, the, these are the impervious areas that we're adding. Um, so we are adding impervious, but it's rooftop impervious adjacent to the building. And then, you know, we're adding impervious, but we're also taking impervious away. You know, it's not, it's not net zero here, but it's, it's, it's not a ton of impervious added. I think um, Bucky had a calculation. I don't know if it was like three or 4% of the 
total impervious in this area um, is what we're adding. So I, I just hope that allays some of your concerns with uh, the impervious area. Thank you, uh, Chris. Um, Alex, I think you're muted if you're- Yeah, Alex, talking. if you had that, if you had that follow-up you wanted, uh, go ahead. Well, I was just complimenting Chris, so he missed all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> um, on, a, okay. on a related topic, and this is separate from what they're here for, so I'll be brief. But if you, if any commissioners have not stood where the town's out, outfall is into Fearing Brook, I suggest you do it because the town owns a significant issue in what it has done to Fearing Brook. And it is on UMass, not UMass, it is on Amherst College property. So during the site visit, I suggested that sometime in the future, not part of this project, the town and, and Amherst College partner uh, to try and figure out how to ameliorate some of the damage which the town is doing to Fearing Brook. The drop off where the 70, where the pipe, the town's pipe, where Fearing Brook comes out of the pipe is about 15 feet. It's dangerous. You could, you could fall off there and get hurt. And in a walk down Fearing Brook, um, trees have fallen off the bank because of the erosion. It's, it's, a, it's a serious problem that the town created a long time ago. And with, with Amherst College doing this project, it's a, it would be a really good time after they finish their being busy with this project to get together with Dave Zomack and Aaron. Uh, and they appreciated the suggestion and thought it was a good one that it would take some grants and some work, but um, the town has done serious damage to Fearing Brook. And I think we have, would we, you couldn't ask for a better partner than Amherst College to work on something like that together um uh, and so i just bring it up now for the record and hopefully bruce will put it in the minutes that that would be a lovely project to consider at another time and if if you if the commissioners are down there and uh it's 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 right across from um ever sources uh substation thank you for the time and amherst college is Sorry to interrupt. Um, Amherst College is committed to working with the town and with the abutter who's who actually, you know, the outfall is on their property, unfortunately. Um, but we are committed with working with all parties to find a solution. Um, Amherst College, you know, our our parking lot and now our new infrastructure, these uh, geo bores that we're installing are the first thing to be affected by the continued erosion um, at the out outfall. Um, so we're trying to stop it in the ways where we can, which is that overland flow over the curb and the discharge from the 12 inch pipe, which is completely on our property. Um, so those are mitigation measures that we're happy to, you know, provide because, you know, ultimately yeah. it, it helps us as well. Um, but there is a much larger issue 54 inches, actually, you can put a put a measurement on the size of the issue um, at that fearing brook outfall. Yeah, and the erosion, and it is, it's very scary right there. And the erosion of the bank is going right up, is headed towards their parking lot. It's, yes. It's, so enough on that. It has, it's tangential to, to this project, and I appreciate the time that you've allowed me to talk about it. Okay. Great ideas, and I and hopefully uh, we'll get to see uh, get to see that um, that cooperation in the future after uh, after this project. Thanks for your willingness to do that too, uh, Chris and Alex. What a what a good good thought. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I'd like Chris and Darren to strongly consider. Um, mimicking the one foot granite curve that you're eventually going to put in at the bottom of the parking lot. Right from now, find mm -hmm. some way to have sediment control that's a foot tall at that spot because it's already overflowing. And by the time you get to the granite curve, it'll have done it 10 more times. 
So I, something that approaches what you're going to have there as a final solution. Thank you. That's a, a good comment, Bruce. We have had a um, like a straw wattle, like a sediment log installed, staked along there. Um, we've done that at this point. But certainly, you know, as we think about the phasing of that, we'll take that into consideration. It, it wouldn't hurt to have that curve there early. I agree. Thanks, Darren and uh, and Bruce. Uh, Jason? Yeah, just to back up what Bruce said and to <clears throat> ask, uh, what size is the, you said you have a sediment log, you have a straw waddle there. Um, I personally am not very fond of straw waddles as they are oftentimes not installed properly. And uh, certainly in a environment where there's high humidity, they tend to rot pretty quick. Um, you are, you can get a compost filter sock in 18 inch diameter, which is roughly, uh, would be roughly 12 inches high. You can even go so far as to try to find a compost diversion sock, which is filled with a different material that does not actually allow water to flow through it, but rather is used to divert water. That being said, you have to have a place to divert the water to, and you have to make sure that you have some sort of velocity dissipator on the end of that, that you're not causing erosion with all of that additional diverted water that's now concentrated. And if you are going to stake something, um, my suggestion would be to stake it as close to the curb, the existing curb as possible, so that it's it doesn't you don't have water jumping the curb, hitting the BMP, and then concentrating, moving one way or the other, uh, perpendicular to flow, and then concentrating flow, and then just undermining the BMP and eroding out underneath it, and then causing an even worse problem than already exists. Thank you. Great. Great uh, good comment. Um, you know, we keep an eye on that straw waddle regularly there, and make sure it is right up against the curb. But yeah, we can look and see if there's a larger diameter, like you're mentioning, the 18 inch filter shock, or what else can be done there. But in the in the interim, of course. Great. Um, I think in the absence of any other quest oh, here we go. Alex, go ahead. I just want to apologize to Amherst College for making them wait for their hearing. Um, <laughs> that was not your fault. And we appreciate your patience. Um, um, we didn't anticipate that, obviously, but uh, um, our apologies. Thank you, Alex. Second that. Yeah, third yeah, that. Third, third, fourth, fourth. <laughs> Probably all of us think the same. Thanks, guys. Chris? As a volunteer on the Northampton Planning Board, I, I would like to thank you all for the service that you provide, because I know it's it's not a lot of fun to be up at 10, 12 at night. So thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side often, so I feel your pain. Thanks, Chris. Well, um, I think with that, we are uh, looking for a motion to um, revisit this in a couple of weeks. I will move to continue the public hearing for DEP number 089-0739 Amherst College East Lot NOI to 72424 at 7.35 p.m.? No, oh, yeah, that's a typo, 7.35. I'm not coming at three o'clock. We can do three. <laughs> I second that. Actually, that might be better. That might be better. But then we'll still be here till 10 o'clock. Okay. okay. I think uh, uh, we've got Jason on the motion, and I believe that Bruce, uh, Bruce second, seconded. Yep. There we go. Okay. Bruce. Aye. Um, Jason. Aye. Rachel. Abstain. Alex. Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Um, Darren and uh, Chris, uh, thank you so much, uh, both for your patience and for your uh, uh, very interesting and, and well set up presentation. Um, we'll see you all, uh, see you guys uh, in two weeks.
Well, thank you. And Aaron, we'll be in touch. That's your memo. <laughs> so, Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So our next uh, hearing number three um, is a uh, hearing of, of it's a uh, notice of intent uh, from Karen uh, Environmental Consulting on behalf of L of uh, LLSE, Fornax, and WD Coles for the construction of a battery storage system associated uh, access road and improvements in stormwater management within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands on Montague Road uh, slash Route 63. Um, and this one is going to be uh, continued. Uh, correct. Is there anything that we needed to discuss before continuing it, uh, Aaron? Yeah, so I sent an email to the commission with a tentative site visit date. I think it was August 22nd um, in late afternoon. And I'm working with them and um, they're going to be coming up with some revisions. They're doing some field work to collect data and they're also adjusting the staking for the site visit in advance. So um, I'm hopeful that they're going to come back with the level of detail that the commission's been asking for. Well, we, oops. Yeah, um, that's that's great. I'm, uh, and I see that we're going to be continuing it until uh, August twenty eighth after our uh, site visit, and they're okay with that. I, I... Yeah, they think that um, they didn't think that they were going to be in time for this meeting or the second meeting in July. And since our first, and I'm glad you brought that up because Bruce wanted to clarify that our first meeting in August is going to be canceled. Um, so that staff can take a vacation and the commission can take a little break um, for the summer. So our next meeting won't be until August 28th. And, and so which date is canceled? Um, the, the first meeting in August, which would be the 15th or the 14th, 14th. rather. Okay, good. I have a question for Aaron. Great, go ahead with it. Aaron, um, will they give us some material a couple of days before the site visit on what we're going to look at rather than them handing it out at the site visit? I would appreciate time to consider what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, I told them that they needed to get us the materials by the 21st, um, which is I'd a week. I'd appreciate the site visit on the 22nd, right? Yes. I'd appreciate more than a day. Okay, so you want a chance to review the materials in advance of the site visit? Yeah. Okay, how how far in advance? It's just because we're asking, for, that's like a week ahead of the CONCOM meeting, so I want to be explicit with them about when you want to receive them, um, like by the 19th or by the end of the week of the 16th? I like it three days before. I have other things to do besides okay. CONCOM. Okay, so the, the Friday the 16th or Monday the 19th, either one of those okay, or would you prefer one or the other? Friday is great, gives me the weekend. Okay. okay. I may even go visit the site before the field visit. I'm gonna, I'm going to um, go to the site. I have um, some samples of vegetation that are in bloom right now and have seeds on them. So I'm going to take a personal look pretty soon and take pictures of what I see because the berries might not be on the plants by the, by the time we get to August. So Good. Any other questions uh, before the uh, motion to continue? Can we talk about this project without them here? I mean, I I try to avoid it as a um, courtesy to them. Like, if we were going to talk about it, would want them to be here. Um, okay, but that's it's fine. really yeah. It, that's uh, fine. I was also, why, I'm also that, thinking about the time right now. Um, it's we're your yeah, note taker, it's your note -taker is fading. <laughs> What's that? The note taker is fading. 
Hey, my wife gets home from town council. I think the last one was 1147. Is so. she the note taker? Yeah, you get no blame for that, Bruce. Yeah, that's right. Let's do it. Yeah, thank you for doing that. All right. I'm looking for I move to continue the public hearing for Montague Road NOI friends DEP number 089-0731. It disappeared from my screen. <laughs> DEP number 089-0731 to August 28, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. Thank you. All right, we got Alex with a motion and Jason with a second. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. Jason? Aye. And Rachel? I think they have to abstain, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think this one was reviewed before you joined, so that's a really good idea. Okay, and I'm an I. Um, so now we're... Uh, I have a procedural question, Chair. Go for it. With regard to Rachel and when she joined and when this project came on, she's been... Is this something that you have to recuse yourself from for professional reasons? I think it has to do with the number of hearings that, um, that. were yeah, missed. Yeah, but it's not because your firm has has had business with them, right? Not not this project. No. Okay. But so she has she has been. I'm interested in in perhaps having her vote eventually. And so I'm asking. She I'm saying she has been on when this project has been before us. Is it possible for her to go back to the hearings that she missed? No, uh, under Mullen's rule, you can only miss one one hearing um, for a given project and review the record and participate. If you miss more than one, then you can no longer vote on the hearing approval. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, emergency certifications. Did we need to, are we there? Yeah, so... Um, this is a uh, a sinkhole that formed in Foxglove Lane. It's uh, where a intermittent stream goes under the roadway. There's also a catch basin beside where the sinkhole formed. So DPW needs to make a road repair. Uh, so the emergency uh, cert was issued for them to repair the infrastructure in the roadway. There was conditions associated with the approval for requiring erosion and sediment controls to be installed prior to construction and stabilization measures. Um, before the erosion controls are removed. Pretty simple though, very small area. All right. I suppose with that, unless there are questions, we'd, uh, we're looking for a motion. I'm, I move to ratify the emergency certification for repair of the roadway infrastructure associated with a sinkhole on Foxglove Lane. I second. It's uh, Alex with a motion and Rachel with a second. Um, Alex. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. And we're moving now to enforcement and compliance updates uh, with starting with the 11, 11 trillion way. Right. So um, at the last meeting, uh, the applicant had submitted some materials day of the meeting, um, which didn't give the commission any time to review the materials. Um, there is a, a planting plan of um, native shrubs that were proposed on the hillside um, in the area where the erosion uh, occurred. And um, the, they submitted a figure with a, a plant list um in hopes that the commission would um, review and approve that so that they can move forward with their um planting and if the commission needs more time that's completely fine if it's too late for us to talk about this we can table the discussion i would like to propose that okay yeah i think that's a wise okay. idea 
Yeah, um, I think, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm dogging it. I think uh, <laughs> if, if anyone isn't, then then I, I give you a lot of credit. I am too. You, you yeah. All right. Um, uh, for second but... dinner. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Totally. Yeah, exactly. Um, the uh, wildflower drive, you know, we did, um, the, the wetlands were delineated, um, and uh, I have been requesting an update from the landowner. I know that um, Steve Riberty, who did the wetland delineation, was away on vacation, I believe, until the 15th of July. So I sort of expect that when he returns, we might get more of a meaningful update, um, but I haven't gotten an update from the landowner. Yeah. Uh, any monitoring reports? per se? Yeah, I mean, there there is a ton of monitoring reports. Um, it's been uh, uh, pretty, pretty busy um, in the construction area. Um, there are going to be some repairs made to Fort River, um, the Fort River uh, school pad where there had been some washouts because they didn't properly install the erosion control blankets. Um, so they're going to be repairing those and putting the erosion control blankets down. I think that's happening this week. Um, there was also a small trail washout at the um, Hickory Ridge Trail, which they're working to repair that. Um, that was from that major storm, the same 200-year storm that affected the um, UMass project, washed out a little section of the new trail at Hickory, unfortunately. Um, but the uh, on the whole, most projects are maintaining relative <laughs> compliance, um, other than the ones that kind of we pointed out tonight. Uh, I do see somebody from the public with their hand raised, Andre. Um, Sounds so. good. We'll... Do you want me to add them in as a, or you got it? Okay, hey, uh, Zoom user, please state your Hi, name. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that uh, I didn't have my uh, name up. This is Iman Mirchi. I just wanted to address the 11 trillion way thing. Um, I understand it's late and um, I've, I've sat through a lot of this meeting as well. Um, I just know that not a month ago, but I think two weeks before that, like six weeks ago, you guys had mentioned that you wanted this to be wrapped up in like two months from then. So um, I don't think it's too much to go through, but I understand it's late. I just wanted to make sure that by pushing this off, um, we're still okay with what you guys had mentioned at that meeting about wanting to wrap this up within that time frame. Yeah, thank you for uh, for your question. Um, I, I think we're I think we're not in any position to uh, to be able to make uh, good good sound uh, decisions uh, right now, and I'm and I apologize for that. Uh, it it's been a long evening. Um, I understand that. Like I said, I just wanted to make sure that we're mindful of that. Um, just wanted to raise that one point. Make sure that we're still okay with that. Yeah, thanks, and our apologies. No, no problem. I understand. Thank you guys for your time. All right. Have a good night. You too. Um, any topics uh, that we haven't anticipated prior to the in the last 48 hours? No. All right. We need a motion then. Yeah, and Bruce has got a hand up. Oh. Oh, I, I just wanted to double the reminder that if our activities two weeks from now means that he can't um, make the deadline we previously set. We have to give him more time. Uh, point taken. Yep. Okay. What's fair is fair, right? Mm -hmm. Looking for a motion. Motion to adjourn. I second that. Oh. Oh, All right. Jason with the motion and uh, Rachel with the second and Laura with a close third. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, folks. Nice. Thanks a lot for, Thanks. Uh, for hanging in. Yeah, thank you guys. Have a good night. Appreciate it. Thank you all.